This guy managed to get it. A book that contains all the knowledge of the world and this book was right now in his hands. One day, a huge tree monster attacked a group of adventurers. The group consisted of four people, among whom there was one magician, guy, a fighter, girl, a warrior, guy and a cleric, girl. The magician, guy shouted to cast a spell and released fiery whirlpools into this tree, monster. Although the whirlpools hit the trunk, it didn't help that much. Magnus, an 18-year-old young magician, shouted to his comrades that it doesn't work. It looks like magic is useless against him. The warrior who was standing in front shouted to Magnus to shut up and asked him why he was so useless. It was Eugene, a young warrior of 16 years old. He received a blessing from the god Trigon. Enraged, Magnus shouted that maybe he should use the magic of other elements, to which Eugene shouted that the guy was an idiot or something. It was a plant-type monster, naturally it was best to use only fire. Magnus doubted it anyway. It's just in theory, maybe in reality it's not. Theories on that and theories that don't always work. Enraged, Eugene shouted for Magnus to close his mouth and listen to him. Magnus sighed and did as he said, and when one of the roots flew towards the warrior, the magician used the same spell and released fire whirlwinds towards the enemy. Eugene easily dodged the blow, and Magnus' fire crashed into that root, but unfortunately the fire, as the guy assumed, was useless. Clenching his teeth, Magnus thought that he could not even harm this monster, despite the fact that Eugene dodged, but it looks like he still got seriously injured, and the clerk of the team ran in his direction to help. Crouching down next to her, she directed her hands towards the wounds and used the heel. Grinning, Eugen said that, as expected from Hilda, she is much more reliable than this useless magician. The girl, smiling kindly, put her hand on the warrior's arm and shyly said that it was just her duty to keep the warrior alive. Perverted Eugene looked at the charms of the priestess and smiled stupidly. At this time, the fourth member of the group with his huge axe inflicted a huge wound on the monster and shouted that the two did not flirt right on the battlefield. It was the warrior girl Misha. In the end, the tree monster growled and fell for dead. Eugene, smiling broadly, raised his fist up and shouted that they had finally killed the death end. Hilda was hugging the warrior at this time, and an excited Misha was looking in the direction of the fallen end. Only the magician was unhappy and didn't say anything. After the triumph was over, the warrior told the group, so that they now collect loot and even decide to steal it. Misha, who was enraged by these words, shouted for the guy to be silent, and meanwhile Magnus, picking up the apple, thought that his fire magic did not even leave a scratch on the end. In the evening, when the moon and stars were shining in the sky, in the kingdom of Lacusta, in a small town, a group of warriors was celebrating in one of the taverns. Someone excitedly told a friend that the warrior's group had returned from a trip, to which he asked in surprise that it was really true, then they were lucky, they should go faster and see what was there. In the tavern, a group of warriors sat at the table and counted apples from the end. Excited Eugene said that they finally got them. Counting fruits, Misha said that it is true that these fruits help to improve the characteristics. Nodding, Eugene said that the fruits of dexterity, strength and reaction belong to Misha, and she happily said that then she would try. As soon as she bit one of the apples, she felt an incredible taste in her mouth, and her strength, agility and reaction rose to a new level. Looking at the transformation of their warrior, Magnus smiled and thought that it was incredible. He would also like to try them. Then the warrior said that the fruits protect him, speed and endurance, and Hilda will get the fruits of holy power and the power of magic. Looking at how Eugene perversely looks at their healer, the guy sighed and thought that he always needed an increase in the strength of his spells. But he will not argue, since the effect is immediately visible on treatment spells. There was only one mana boost left and the guy twisted his mouth, thinking that apparently he was the only one left. But to his regret, Eugene picked up the fruit, said that he would take this mana boost fruit. Stunned, Magnus couldn't stand slamming his fist on the table and indignantly said that but he was just raising mana. Eugene said that it was obvious, he used skills much more often than Magnus. Looking at the guy with an arrogant smile, Hilda supported Eugene. She smiled sweetly and said that the fact remains that Magnus was useless in the last battle. The magician frowned and looked at them with a non-expressive face and shifted his gaze to Misha. Seeing that looking at her while eating another fruit, she said that she also agrees with Eugen, because if he wants to get something so much, he does not think that he should work it out first. The guy clenched his fist and thought that these bastards themselves did not allow him to use other spells and now they are saying something. If he used it, he just couldn't help but do at least some damage. Eugene, chewing an apple with regret, said that apparently inviting this guy to the team was a mistake. He thought that the magician would turn out to be a genius, but it turned out that he was a complete disappointment. 
Hilda smiled and said that Magnus was the first person who could read the sacred words, and this was how he complimented their team. The guy frowned at the girl, but her sweet smile turned into a contemptuous grin, and the priestess said that this was the only thing he could do, otherwise Magnus was a complete jerk. The guy clenched his fist, and Eugene continued, saying that it turns out that magicians are completely useless. It is obvious that physical strength is much more effective in battle. Hilda laughed with the warrior and said that he was right. Pointing to Magnus, Eugene said that they no longer needed him, so he could get lost, and then he saw the dark look of the magician. Magnus got up without saying anything and just left. Nisha asked him that he would just leave, to which the guy said that she had heard them herself. They need physical strength, not magic. Nisha, with reddened eyes, said that this was the act of a coward, to which he bit his lip and told her to think what she wanted. Outside, Magnus sighed and looked at the night sky and asked what was waiting for him now. Sighing, the guy thought that they had expected so much from him, and now it was somehow inconvenient to return home. The guy remembered the city academy, where his magic teachers told him to go with the hero to defeat the demon king. It would be an honor for their academy. They continued it so cordially. Sighing, the guy thought that he represents all the magicians and wizards of his homeland. He is obliged to save the world and improve his characteristics. Filled with determination, the guy stomped in the alley saying that he simply could not return. While he was stomping, someone called him, and turning around, he saw some peasant running in his direction asking Mr. Magician to stop. The guy turned around and said that he remembered this guy. He was in the tavern. The sweating man said he was right. He was hoping to see a group of warriors who had returned to the city, but he accidentally overheard their conversation. The guy put his hands on his sides and asked what of what was said then made him pay attention to him. The peasant smiled and said that he was sure that he had heard that he could understand the sacred words. The guy nodded and then the peasant took out his backpack and began rummaging through it and soon handed the guy a book and said that he thought it would interest him. The surprised guy looked at the cover and realized that everything was written in sacred words. His eyes immediately brightened and he read the title of the book, although the guy wasn't even sure if it was the name. It was written there that everything you need to know to defeat the demon king will be here. The description also said to relax the guy, because this book was written by the gods themselves. The guy couldn't hold back his smile and thought that it was interesting to iron it out. Looking at her, the guy thought about what they said that only the gods and their apostles can understand the sacred words, and it looks like he is one of them. There are many ways to fake a book, but if it's a book of God, then that's another story. The guy put the book in a bag and said that he wanted to buy it, how much does it cost? The peasant smiled and said that since only he could read it, the man wanted to give it to him, but if the guy is uncomfortable, he can give a couple of coins. Smiling, the guy took out three coins and asked if that might be enough. At night in the hotel, the guy started his reading. It was said in the book that all the monsters of this world originated from the evil energy of the demon king. Therefore, as long as their king is alive, there is no difference how many of the monsters will be killed. They will appear again and again. The guy was sweating from what he read. This book contained all the knowledge of the world. Reading this, the guy finally realized why the monsters that were killed before came back again. Soon he found information about the monster they had recently dealt with. Three days later, the guy came to the place where he was and soon met that monster. Or rather, the end of death. The surprised guy recoiled in shock, saying that it really works. It was written in the book that you need to plant a seed in infected lands, and a new smart ant will appear on the hill north of the village in three days. It was incredible. He felt that with this book he would turn the world upside down. Clutching his staff, the guy took a pose and said it was time to do it. A one-on-one -on -one fight against an unknown death ant. While Ant was looking around and didn't notice him, the guy was thinking that it looks like this monster isn't even looking at him. If this is the case, then he will take this chance. Taking a deep breath, the guy recited a spell and a flash of light blinded the ant. The death ant is known for its resistance to special magic and weakening magic. He believed it, but every monster has its own weakness, which it cannot resist. Licking his lip with excitement, the guy said that the weakness of Ent is hypnosis. Because of the flash, Ent fell into a deep sleep of illusions. According to the book he read, the monster is a death boss Ent, a plant-type creature that has a contract resistance to all fire-type attacks. Ent's weakness is lightning. The note said that when faced with this monster, fire magic is generally useless. It's simple, he has to use lightning magic, and the parasite is him. While reciting his spell, the guy released mana into the air. Lightning tongues began to form around him and they all concentrated on the top of his staff. The guy also used the magic of strengthening damage enhancement, increasing damage on a single target and increasing critical damage and remembering the muzzle of Eugene, who spoke. 
that this plant type monster is weak to fire, chuckled. Ujin was deeply mistaken. Well, it doesn't matter, he's also to blame anyway, because he should have trusted his instincts, not the words of a warrior. Lightning crackled around the guy and he thought that he should no longer allow himself to be shouted at. He uses his cunning, strength and knowledge to defeat the demon king himself. He will make the whole world know his name and show that magicians are the most powerful and respected people in this world. It was written in the book that the supreme gods would not interfere in any situation. They respect those who strive to get on their feet using only their strength and wisdom. All they can help is a book and this is information. The guy's fate is in his own hands. They wish him courage and determination on his journey. Well, it was written in the book. The guy shouted the key words of the spell and lightning flew towards the end, frying him to a crisp. Ant fell senseless, and then disappeared, and fruits appeared in the sky and fell to the ground. Immediately after, the guy felt his strength increase, because he raised the level and with it his health, speed, holy power and mana increased. The surprised guy felt the experience roll through his body. His strength has definitely increased significantly. At this time, his backpack lit up, and the guy saw it, said that it was impossible, taking out a book. He happily said that it was a book, just a treasure of knowledge, an omnipotent book that only he can use. As a result, Magnus managed to finish off eight death ends and now he had level 28. While eating an apple, the guy was reading his status with a book in his hand. His wind, earth, mana storage, poison and paralysis have reached level 3. All his skills improved after the fights, and their strength increased too. If he continues to level up so quickly, he will need better equipment. The guy looked at his staff, which was of rank D it would be cool, of course, if he could get a staff of rank S, but to get such a staff is too much, yes, even a staff of rank is out of reach. They are very rare items, so he is unlikely to find it in a regular store, and even if he is lucky, it will cost a fortune. The guy folded his arms under his chest and thought about money and staffs, sighing. The guy realized that this was a lost cause and lay down on his bed. It seems impossible in his current situation. His gaze accidentally hit the page of the book, and he stood up in surprise, it was the same thing. Running on the roofs of houses, the guy thought that he would repay those who allowed him to gain such power. Soon he finally nailed it to the place he needed. Smiling proudly, he looked down from the house. Then he went to the chimney of the house and bent down there. Before descending, of course, he read a spell and seeing how he was slowly falling, he smiled and said that this was an excellent spell for controlling the speed of falling. He didn't expect to have to enter through the chimney. The good thing is that he still remembers this spell. According to the book, he will be able to learn flying when he gets level 29. He was wondering what free flight was like. Finally he landed and climbed out of the oven. The penetration was successful. Smiling, the guy went in the direction that is needed. He was calm, because the book said that the mansion was currently empty. This place was used as the residence of the king of the staff. Opening the door, the guy looked at the office, on both sides of which there were cabinets with books, and in the center was a desk. A skull and crossbones stood alone on the table. Looking at this, the guy thought that the king of staffs was considered the strongest wizard of the kingdom of Lacusta. Approaching the table, the guy collected the bones in a handkerchief while remembering what he had read. Ten years ago, however, the magician was left to die alone in this mansion. There was also a beautiful staff next to the table, and of course the guy took it. It was the staff of the Supreme S rank. This staff is made entirely of mithril, so it is very light. But best of all, he has a red crystal as his magical catalyst. This is a very rare material. But only looking at its size, the guy realized that this staff is simply incredible. With excitement, the guy took the staff and said that this staff could cost about 10,000 coins in the store. No, even for 100,000, a huge number of people would agree to buy it. Putting the staff aside, the guy opened the book saying that the cost of this staff is enough to then live 500 years as a nobleman. He still can't believe it happened to him. Moreover, the staff's abilities are simply incredible. When using it, the damage of all attacking spells increases by 79%. The effectiveness of the support spell increases by 186%, and the user also has a 51% chance of reducing the enemy's resistance to special magic and weakening magic. The staff also reduced mana consumption by 25%, and it also increased the duration of single and special magic. It was just the perfect staff. In the mountain outside the city, the guy put a grave in which he buried the bones of that magician and put a flower there. Just as the sun rose and got down on one knee, the guy said that after the death of the great magician, this spear was forgotten by everyone. 
but he continued it. He swears that he will return this staff and bury it near its owner. One day he will crush the demon king and bring peace to these lands. After that, Magnus used the information from the book to find out about other treasures. He collected all the items he could find on the territory of the kingdom, and his targets were groups of bandits who had at least something worthwhile. Now he had an a rank sage staff, a thunder sword also of the same rank, a divine protection ring also of a rank. Of course, he also managed to save someone's life. So one day he saved three girls from the clutches of bandits, stealing a magic scroll for one. The girls happily thanked him, and explained that they had been captured and treated like slaves. The guy was of course amazed by their sweetness and confused, thinking that it was hard. The girls asked if they could find out the name of the savior, and the guy only now realized that he had no immunity to cute girls. He definitely can't refuse these eyes. Looking away in embarrassment, the guy said that his name was not worthy of mention, and told them that he would take them home. Although he saved a couple of people, it's also illegal to take the bandit's belongings, so it's better not to shine his face. Soon he delivered the girls to the city and after asking around, he thought that maybe one day he would meet them again. But that would be another story. The guy was sitting in the room counting his staffs. There were as many as ten ordinary staffs from the rank. Then came his relics, and then the treasures along with the books. Thinking about it, the guy picked up the thunder a rank sword and said that perhaps he would leave the items suitable for him and sell the rest. Items of rank C are very rarely found in stores, so if he sells such a quantity right away, then he will attract too much unnecessary attention. Thinking about it, the guy said that he had to find a suitable place and time to sell them. First he needs to find a merchant he can trust. These are all the most valuable items, so the merchant must be known. With these thoughts, the guy opened the book and began to read. The next day, the guy was looking at the magnificent building of the Malmo Merchants Association. This association was the largest association for the sale and creation of magical items. While he was admiring the splendor of the association, he suddenly saw familiar people. It was a warrior's group. Eugene, clicking because of something, said that this was not there either. Hilda comforting him said that it was nothing, because they had just started looking, so Eugene should be patient. Misha also nodded, saying that he did not think that they would find everything at once. There was also a new person with them, or rather a beast, man. Suddenly the eyes of Eugene and Magnus met and then the guy saw a cat girl with brass knuckles who was wearing a kippow. Sighing, the guy thought that so that's who he was exchanged for. They quickly found a replacement. Eugene seeing Magnus irritably called him, but the magician was completely indifferent. While Eugene was angry about something, the guy told them that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. What were their fates? Did they really want to buy something? The irritated warrior said it was none of his business. The guy nodded and turned around and said that Eugene's words made sense, so he hoped they would find what he was looking for, and he would probably go. Here Misha stopped Eugene saying that Magnus might know something. He is still a magician. Hilda, too, clinging to the guy, said that it could be tried. Eugene obeyed Hilda looked at Eugene with a gloomy look, but Magnus, as before, was indifferent and asked if they needed something from him. Displeased, Eugene explained that they were looking for a magic staff. Does Magnus know where to find it? They know it's hard to buy. The guy with a brick face said that maybe he knows, and remembered his staffs, of which there were already ten. The surprised guy happily smiled and asked where he could buy it, and then Magnus asked him why he was wondering why they needed a staff if they didn't have a magician in their team. Hearing this, Eugene frowned, and then said that this was a task from a nobleman named Demid. Had he heard about it? Well, it doesn't matter, he should hurry up and tell them where they can get the staff. Twisting his mouth in indifference, the guy thought that, as usual, Eugene does not know how to ask for a favor. Coming out ahead of Eugene, Hilda folded her hands and said that they really needed it. Magnus is a kind man, he can tell them. With an indifferent face, the magician said that it just so happened that he had it. If they needed it so much, then he could sell it. Eugene happily smiled and shouted that this time M1 proved useful. At the same time, Hilda appeared in front of him and said that they could buy a staff for 1-0 coins. If that was not enough, then for 12-0. The guy folded his arms under his chest, curling his mouth in discontent, said that really these people really have money. Hilda clasped her hands in prayer and said that in order to support war in his endeavors, the church provides war loved in all possible ways. Chuckling, the guy said that he understood. And I thought to myself that these saints from the church always talk about the infinite love of God directed at them even if it goes against their principles to use healing magic to extort huge sums from the poor. Well, it means that he can take the money without feeling guilty. The guy nodded and said that then let them get 12 o-coins. The girl thanked him with a blissful smile. 
The guy looking at her inwardly sighed thinking that for the sake of profit she bowed to the one whom she openly ridiculed a few days ago. But the guy is sure that inside she feels humiliated and furious. The guy, not understanding why she was doing this, wondered why she had gone so far for the staff of rank C. The guy did not hesitate to give the staff, and then Eugene laughed loudly and said that Magnus knew why they were trying so hard to get it. Everything is simple, because the person looking for this staff offers it a mithril sword. But such a sword can be sold for 5,000 coins in a store. Eugene laughed mockingly, expecting Magnus' emotions. But Magnus, with a completely expressionless face, pulled a smile and said he was happy for them. From this Eugene came into a stupor, and then his mouth was wide open. Looking at him, the guy thought that did these jerks think that he would be upset about this. Even so, it's not such a big deal because he has as many as six such swords that are not comparable to his A. Grade sword, the Thunder Sword. So he genuinely didn't care. Gritting, the guy walked past wishing this group good luck with the task of killing the Demon King. When the guy was passing by, Misha asked if he still didn't want to come back to them. The guy looked at him and asked if he should. The guy looking at her thought that the expression on Misha's face then was like that of an offended child. He saw her so strange for the first time. Entering the association, Magnus looked around in surprise, thinking that he needed to find a place to sell. Which rack should he choose? While the guy was looking around, suddenly someone called him, and when the guy turned around, he saw a familiar face. It was one of the girls he rescued when they were captured by slavers. The blonde cutie, seeing the savior, trembled all over, and then bent down, asked for forgiveness and asked if the guy could go on a date with her. Her face turned red, and her huge eyes shone incredibly straight eating the guy, because of which he was embarrassed, recoiled and asked what the girl meant. Soon he was running away from the association, taking the girl by the hand. When they finally reached the alley, the guy stopped, and the whole sweaty and tired girl began to breathe deeply, because she had shortness of breath. The guy, looking at her, expected, but still could not stand it, embarrassedly told her not to say such things in public, it would only put them in an awkward position. The girl, still not catching her breath, asked for a petition and said that she simply could not resist. The guy looking at her thought that it was bad, because this girl saw how he took away the treasures, although they were bandits, but according to the law it is forbidden to steal from bandits. Now the guy was thinking about how he could make the girl not tell anyone about it. The girl with a slight blush looked at the guy and asked if she really caused problems to the guy. The guy shook his head and put one hand in his side and said that this was not the case, but she should answer his question. Does she work for the association? The girl said that of course she does not understand that this does not excuse her, but she finally met him again, so she could not help but turn to him. Straightening her back, the girl put her hand on the pile, said that she was the daughter of the head of the largest association of merchants, so she could not miss this opportunity. The guy's gears immediately turned in his head and he thought that she was the daughter of the main merchant of the association. Folding his arms under his chest and becoming serious, the guy looked at the girl with concern and asked her what her name was, to which she replied that her name was Aria. The guy swallowed and asked her about it, so why did she say such embarrassing things then? The girl smiled, clenched her fists and excitedly said that she just wanted to thank the guy for saving her life. The guy looked at her puppy dog eyes and blushed, but her eyes were so shiny and were so sensual that the guy just couldn't take his eyes off them. At the same time, he thought about how she really wanted to thank him in this way. Shaking his head, the guy said that this simply could not have happened to him, and then, still managing to look away, he thought that such a capable magician as he should not rush to conclusions. He has to think carefully about everything, because he still needs to be careful with this. The girl, seeing the guy's reaction, embarrassedly and quietly said that it looked like the guy was not happy with her company. Did he really want something more? The confused girl began to approach the guy in desperation. Shrinking, she recalled the moment when they were captured, and said that at that moment, kidnapped and desperate, she was very scared, thinking about her immediate future, she was devastated. But then Magnus came and defeated all the bandits. Of course, then the girl showed that the guy is a knight on a white horse. He was so kind and great that he saved all of them. Because of her work, she has met many people, but she has never met such an incredible person. The guy, listening to her, scratched his head, not knowing what to do with it. Due to the fact that he is still young, it would be a lie to say that he is not interested in a relationship. However, he still owns the mission to kill the Demon King. Although the girl was charming, and he could hardly take his eyes off her, but he simply has no other choice but to tell her that he can't. But instead Magnus, who was sweating all over and covered in cold sweat running down his face in streams, trembling apologized and said that he had no experience in relationships. Internally, he himself was blown away by what he was carrying. 
After all, he only wanted to tell her about his mission. Why did he say this nonsense? He seems to be panicking. Magnus couldn't believe that he was a wizard who had to defeat the Demon King in the future, panicking so much in front of a girl. To his surprise, the girl, like himself, was covered with cold sweat running down her face, and Allred said that there was no problem, because she also had no experience. In fact, the guy will be her first. Seeing her panic, the guy asked in shock about why she was also panicking. Sighing and pulling himself together, the guy coughed dryly. The guy thought that to be honest, he doesn't hate something like this. The guy put one hand in his side and said that since she insists so much, he thinks that going on a date would not be a bad idea. Although he has no experience in such matters, so most likely it will be unsuccessful. The girl, delighted with Magnus's answer, clapped her hands and said that if so, then it's great. Then she said she wasn't worried about that, they both had no experience. The guy awkwardly scratching the back of his head said that this was of course a very great relief. In the eyes of the guy, the girl was shining straight, and beaming like that, she put her hands on her chest with a kind smile and said that she didn't mind offering the guy everything she had. The guy, embarrassed and all red, awkwardly smiled and looked away. Then sighing, he looked back at the girl and said that he would then introduce himself again. His name is Magnus. The surprised girl asked about the fact that the same magician Magnus, who is in the hero's group. Hearing this, the guy awkwardly grinned and said that he was kicked out, so it's not like that anymore. He's just Magnus now. Hearing the words of the guy, the girl enraged, asked about how they could be so stupid. Even a simple girl like her can understand that Mr. Magnus is unrealistically strong. The guy with the expressionless face smiled and said that it was already in the past, so now everything is fine. But the guy thought to himself that although Eugene was a complete idiot, he could not speak ill of the hero's group. The guy, thinking about the date, was covered with cold sweat running down her face and stammered, asking about what they would do on this date. The girl was no different from him, so she also trembled and said that she would have a day off next Wednesday. The guy awkwardly asked that then they would see each other next Wednesday, to which she blushed and nodded. The guy, thinking about this cutie, thought that if he got close to Aria, she wouldn't tell anyone that he was taking things from bandits. Having also made friends with the daughter of the main merchant, he will have no problem selling items. But if you put business and benefits aside, then he actually lied. Embarrassed, the guy felt like his heart was rapidly forgotten and pulling a smile. He still could not restrain himself and turned around and like some high school student huddled in bed, saying that although this is his first time, but love is beautiful. Wednesday came, the date day, on South Street, where they planned a meeting. The guy walking through the streets thought that the dating book said that an early arrival on a date would lay a strong foundation for further relationships. But the guy thought it was stupid, it was just illogical, so he decided to come exactly at the specified time. As he walked through the streets, one couple after another caught her eye. Ignoring them, the guy thought that although he had some thoughts on this matter, then the guy imagined how he would be late and the girl sitting waiting to look at him. Then he will ask for forgiveness and ask if he made her wait, to which she will say with a smile that she has just come. Imagining this, he coughed in embarrassment and thought that it would be nice. When he finally reached the designated place, the surprised guy saw a girl waiting for him next to the fountain. The guy awkwardly scratching the back of his head asked for forgiveness for making her wait, and she smiled shyly and said that she was so excited that she had been waiting for him here since the morning. Hearing this, the guy thought that it was so cute. The guy smiled and told her that then they can go to a place where they serve great dishes. The delighted girl asked if Magnus had really cooked something, to which he proudly smiled and said that this was indeed the case. The girl smiled broadly and happily and said that she was happy. The guy, looking away in embarrassment, thought about whether to let her take her hand, it would be just wonderful. With these thoughts, the guy tried to grab her hand, and did it, but the girl abruptly let go of his hand. The stunned guy recoiled thinking that he had been thrown. But suddenly a trembling hand approached his hand and the surprised guy looked down. The girl's little hand clasped their hands and the guy also succumbed to temptation. Feeling the softness of the girl's hands, the guy thought that it was incredible. With a blush, the guy looked at the girl and then their eyes met. Holding up the binding of the hand, the girl smiled and said, Magnus, that they should go. Flushing from the girl's mylody, the guy without saying anything went after her thinking that what an amazing girl she is. When they finally reached the place they sat down at the same table. The girl excitedly said that she loved pancakes very much, then the guy asked if she had been here before. The girl smiled and said that this was her first time here. And then clapping her hands, the girl said that Magnus seemed to know this place pretty well. The guy nodded with a smile, saying that recently, he accidentally stumbled upon her. 
The dishes here are very tasty, so he wanted Aria to try it too. Ev in front of them, the waiter put pancakes on a plate and asked for forgiveness for waiting. The pancakes were beautifully placed on top of which there was cream and berries. The excited girl happily looked at them and the guy thought that according to the book, excellent cakes should be prepared here, but not very many people know about this place. The guy thought that in this case reputation is not important, because too many people could spoil the atmosphere and appetite. Putting the amulet in his mouth, the guy blissfully chewed it, thinking that this omelette perfectly emphasizes the taste of the whole dish as a whole. The salty taste goes best with bacon. The guy raised his head and asked the girl how her food was and yes, with hearts in her eyes, savored the taste of the omelette and blissfully said that this was the most delicious dish that she had ever tasted. The sweet taste of an apple is perfectly combined with the sour taste of berries, and this turns into a euphoria of flavors. Looking at Aria's joyful face, the guy asked what they could share with each other, to which the girl said that she was only glad of it. The guy, seeing the joyful face of the girl, smiling himself, thought that he had done well to find this place. It was definitely worth all his hard work on the search. After they finished, they left the restaurant and a joyful Aria sang in a sweet voice that it was the best food she had ever eaten. The guy looking at her with a smile said that he was glad of it. Then Aria snuggled up to the guy's hand and asked about where they would go now. The guy, feeling the softness with his hand, felt embarrassed and looked at the dignity of his girlfriend. After that, the guy took the girl to a jewelry store and bought her a beautiful pendant, followed by a walk, then lunch at a chic restaurant and after another short walk, evening came and the moon took the furrows of its rule. Walking down the street, Aria said that today was a lot of fun, so she is grateful to Magnus. The guy smiled and said that he was glad that she liked everything. The excited girl said that she had to thank him somehow. The guy looked at the cute girl who excitedly clenched her fist and asked that wasn't today a thank you. The girl thoughtfully said that then you need a reward for this gratitude. The girl ran forward and stood in front of the guy and said that the guy would promise her to go on a date with her again. Then she sat up and her lips touched Magnus's. Feeling the softness of his lips, the guy blushed and looked shocked at the confused and heated girl. Looking up from the bottom, Aria asked that this was the first time for Magnus. And then she turned around and ran away. The guy stood in a stupor for a few more minutes and trembled. He was covered with cold sweat running down his face and thought that he had just been kissed. Lifting his head up, the guy sighed and then took out his book, saying that thanks to her, he had a great date. In this book there was a chapter in which they write about important people and it describes in detail all the information about Aria, the daughter of the head of the Association of Merchants of Malma. With this information, their next date will also be just as cool. Remembering her, the guy smiled and thought that while she was happy, he was happy. This book is just incredibly useful. You can achieve anything with it. In his house, Magnus dangled his legs while reading his book and at the same time lying on the couch. While reading, he said that he had found all the hidden objects, what to do next. Suddenly, he dazedly brought the book closer and wondered if this was not the same girl they were trying to save. The book said it was a side job. There they must rescue Mel from the village of Enzo. Neil was an ordinary 14-year-old village girl who couldn't get out of bed because of a strange illness. The disease was unusual in that it was immune to the holy magic of healing. At that time, he was absolutely helpless. In the Book of the World it was written that the cause of the disease is the curse of the monster and the only way to save her is to destroy the caster. Getting up from his seat, the guy squeezed the staff and said that now he would go to Enzo's village and save her. A few days later, he was already next to the village head Enzo. The surprised old man asked about the fact that this guy wants to kill a monster near their village. But is he really planning to go alone? Calmly taking a sip from the glass, the guy said that for personal reasons he left the hero's group. Stroking his beard, the head of the village said that even so, Magnus remains an excellent magician. The guy smiled and said that the head of the village was flattering him. Then the guy said that in that case he should stay here for a couple of days. Hearing this, the head of the village nodded and said that of course the magician could stay in his house as long as he wished. Clasping his hands, the old man said that his son and his family had died because of the plague, so he had a couple of spare rooms. Coughing, the guy said that he would like to talk about the disease. The head of the village raised his head with a start and then the guy said that it was connected with the old man's granddaughter. The surprised old man asked about what Mel had to do with it and the guy coughed dryly, said that he was not completely sure, but it seemed to him that by destroying this monster, he could save her. Surprised, the old man could not resist slapping the table and standing up asked if it was really true, to which the guy immediately calmed him down, said that he had previously said that he was not sure for sure, it was just an assumption. The head of the village sat down again, or rather fell on his chair 
put his hand on his forehead and in a trembling voice, asked for forgiveness and said that he could not restrain himself. The guy folded his arms under his chest, looking at the old man, thought that to be honest, he just exaggerated, but the way he plans to leave right after killing the monster and saving her granddaughter, this is the best he could say. This will help to avoid problems. He certainly doesn't want this old man and his poor granddaughter to think that they owe him. And Magnus doesn't want to be in such an awkward situation when he is so much thanked. Just imagining it, the guy was embarrassed and covered in sweat. Having made up his mind internally, he said that he should try. When Magnus went hunting the next day, what he feared happened. All red and sweating, he looked at the villagers who cheered him on. Some child wished him a safe journey. And one old lady said that Mel is a kind girl, so she hopes that Mr. Magnus will save her. Some girl from the village said that they believed Mr. Magnus, and some teenager, clenching his fist, said that of course he did not want to admit it, but Mr. Magician was the only one who could do it. In short, everyone wished Magnus good luck, and this confused him. Looking at the old man who was looking at him expectantly, the guy pulled a smile, thinking that this old man seemed to have already blabbed to everyone. Climbing up the hill and leaving the village, the guy thought that even though this is a normal situation, and it seems like he can cope with that monster, but he's still nervous. A light of the sun penetrated through the leaves of the tree, illuminating the way for Magnus. Feeling something, Magnus stopped, turned around and saw a shadow. From the other side, there was the sound of someone walking who was wearing heavy armor. When the figure appeared from behind the trees, the guy saw an armored warrior with two scars on his face. The guy recognized this man and asked why he was here, but the knight only knelt down on one knee and looked down at him. Magnus asked that he was a glance. Bowing his head, the armored guard of the village of Enzo said that it was an honor for him that his name was remembered by the great magician, Magnus. The guy thought about it, thought that if his memory is not to fail, then this guy was the guardian of the village. In that situation, it was really difficult to remember everyone. In a way, the guy was proud of his memory. Raising his head, the guardian said that he had a request to the magician, and then he asked for permission so that he could help Magnus. The surprised guy asked that this guy wanted to fight the monster together with him. Glance looked at him seriously and nodded, saying that he was asking for this favor. Looking at the guard's uniform, which was dented, Magnus thought that it looked like this big guy had a lot of combat experience and he was much stronger than the usual guards of the village. The guy raised his hand in a gesture, asked the guard about why he needed it at all. Is it really because of the objects, or is it still for the sake of protecting the village? The guardian, hearing the question, bowed his head and said that to be honest, he just wants to save Mel. When Magnus looked closer, he saw the confusion on the face of this guardian. Grinning, the magician nodded, and that's how they went hunting together. Along the way, Glance said that he and Mel are childhood friends, even though he is only four years older than her. The guy, hearing this, froze in place, and then, in shock, turning his head in the direction of Glance, with cold sweat running down his face, asked that he was only 18. To himself, Magnus was shocked to think that they simply could not be the same age. In appearance, this guy is at all 30. Glance, not paying attention to the guy's stupefaction, continued to walk, saying that he fell in love with Mel. Then the guy, accepting the truth, continued on his way and asked what the Guardian was going to tell her about his feelings, to which Glance said that it was too difficult. Then the guy looked at himself and said that, and with such an appearance, he just can't do it. He just wanted to become strong enough to protect her. He left the village and joined the army, and then returned and became a guard in the village. He was very worried when he found out that his beloved was ill, so when rumors about Magnus' assignment started, he just couldn't stay away. After hearing the guard's story, the guy admiringly said that this was truly laudatory devotion. After that, the guy stopped and looked at the guard and asked that he knew it was dangerous, to which he nodded and said that it was, but he still wanted to do it. The guy, still looking doubtfully at the guard, said that he should have already found out that Magnus was a magician, and he would not be able to protect him in battle if anything happened. Slapping his chest, Glance said that there is no need for this, Mr. Magnus can use it as his sewing. Hearing such determination in the guy's voice, the guy said that it was probably too much. To this, the Guardian said that he was even ready to sacrifice himself for Mel. In fact, it seemed to him that he was improving his skills just for the sake of this day. Sighing, the guy nodded and said that since he was so insistent, Magnus had no reason to stop him. To himself, the guy thought that if, honestly, a warrior would not put such a magician as him, and as a man, he can understand how Glance feels. But still, no one wants to die like that, even someone like him. Finally deciding, the guy excitedly told the guard to approach him, because they still have to discuss strategy. Sitting down, the two men started with a plan. 
Having written something on the ground, Magnus explained everything to the Guardian and said that this was about how they would act. Nodding, Glance said that he remembered everything. Then Magnus asked that, judging by the skills of the Guardian, he was somewhere a warrior of about 7th, 9th level, to which the surprise Glance said that it was amazing, did Mr. Magician have an assessment? Magnus raised his wand and said that it was, but he could only view the main characteristics. Smiling, the guy looked at the glance and thought that this only works if the assessment is applied to a lower level, so it's easier to find out the characteristics of a simple guard. But their opponent is level 19, so they need to decide how to overcome this difference between levels. Suddenly, a hum of voices rang out throughout the forest, and feeling the pressure, the magician and the warrior abruptly stood up and prepared for battle. Glance stood in front and raised the shield, taking a defensive pose, and Magnus stepped back and readied his staff. Turning pale, the guard was covered with cold sweat running down his face and informed Mr. Magnus that the monster was probably approaching. And the guy grinned and said that it was so, so Glance should be on the alert. With a thud, a huge monster with horns and covered with bushes appeared right in front of the two guys. It was the monster boss of the forest giant. As soon as Magnus saw him, he began to cast a spell. One of the additional effects of the Staff of the Almighty was to increase the effectiveness of the support spell by 186%, and therefore, Magnus simply did not make a reservation not to use it. Flashes of light illuminated the body of the tank, and he hung a buff aura of fire, magic shield and magic armor on it. After the buffs, Glance literally lit up, and a notification popped up in front of him, telling him that his defense, agility, strength, reaction, fire attribute and sacred defense were enhanced. Feeling incredible strength, Glance said that it seems Magnus has already told him about it, but it still feels incredible. It seems as if an infinite amount of energy is flowing in his body. It's a miracle to get such power from Mr. Magnus himself. Filling the sword with flame, Glance took a pose, and then the monster growled and sent his huge palm towards the guys. Looking at this monster, the guy thought that no normal person would dare to attack a monster head-on, since it is very difficult to overcome fear in a battle with such a terrible monster. But his mage skill resilience has the same effect as the calming skill of a priest. This skill plus perseverance created a feeling for Mel, such a fearless warrior as Glance. Glance swung his sword, filled with fire, and struck straight at the monster's leg. Looking at what even his blow did harm, the guy smiled and mentally thanked Mr. Magnus. Now, it's much easier for him to defeat this big guy. A wound appeared on the monster's leg, and feeling the pain, the monster growled sending his fist towards the warrior. But Glance was able to jump away from the place where the monster's fist hit. Looking at this, Magnus grinned and said that it doesn't matter how strong the monster's attacks are if it can't hit the enemy. Thanks to Magnus's buff, Glance had a hell of a high dexterity right now. Looking at the warrior, the magician said that these were the eyes of a forest giant. He should be wondering why he can't do worthwhile damage. The guy grinned and prepared the next spell. Glance jumped back again before he was swatted, and looking at this, Glance began to remember their plan before the fight. Everyone had weaknesses, so Magnus said that he would constantly apply weakening magic to the monster. At the same time, he would increase the dexterity of the Glance to reduce the chance of hitting it. In other words, Glance should dodge while he can. Glance nodded then, but he still had doubts, but now seeing the effect of Magnus' magic and how easily he dodged the blows himself, he couldn't believe it. Immediately after the guy dodged, he was followed by a blow with a fiery sword, which was not enough, but still caused damage to the monster. Seeing that their plan was working out, Magnus smiled and said that it was great. He himself thought that if he fought alone, he would still use this strategy and would eventually be able to defeat him. However, thanks to Glance, the time for killing the boss was significantly reduced. According to the book, the monster boss has little resistance to fire, which is why they use it. After Magnus' spell, a new notification popped up in front of Glance, saying that his critical damage and damage to single targets had been increased fivefold. After that, Magnus immediately started heavy artillery and cast the spell of the fire vortex. Hearing the spell, Glance immediately jumped back and a huge fire vortex in the form of heavy artillery flew at the monster. The shocked knight watched as a whirlwind of fire flew right next to him and engulfed the monster. A whirlwind of fire destroyed the monster, and when he disappeared, the whole crumpled warrior appeared on the ground. The guy sighed and said that it was good that he put a magic shield on this guy. Without this, the tank would not have had a chance to withstand that attack. After telling that guy that it was over, they decided to come back. The goal of this whole adventure has been achieved. Soon the tank drank the potion and was cured, and then they returned to the village of Enzo. Of course, the residents greeted the guy with admiration, 
but they did not treat Glance so well. They asked him why the hell he rushed there and said that they couldn't find a place for themselves without him. Of course, some residents calmed down the angry ones, saying that everything ended well, the guy smiled when he saw it. Suddenly someone touched Magnus, and this girl screamed in embarrassment, saying that she was finally able to touch a real great magician. Seeing her, other girls from the village also wanted to touch the guy and ran towards him. The guy, confused, wondered if it was really so important for them to touch him. Then the guy noticed the children who admiringly said that the roar of that monster was scary and loud, so much so that it could be heard even here. The surprised guy smiled awkwardly and thought that it was somehow too much. After all, how could you hear the cry of that monster from here? At this time, someone called the guy and when he turned around, he saw Mel, who looked at him with a smile. Mel was also happy for the girl, and at this time Glance also looked at the girl in embarrassment. When Magnus saw that the big man was averting his eyes, he mentally sighed. Then the head of the village appeared and thanked the guy with tears in his eyes and said that he could not even express his gratitude in words. The old man still couldn't believe that his daughter was alive and well. The girl also clapped her hands and said that the monster really seemed to be the cause of her illness, and then she asked the guy how she could thank him. The guy smiled and took the big guy's hand and said that if there was anyone to thank, it was him. With that, he pulled it closer. Glance was very confused, and the girl was surprised. Magnus smiled and said that this guy had made a lot of effort to save the girl. Then the guy told how Glance caught up with him and how they fought together. He also praised the guy to the girl, saying that Glance is a real hero. Glance blushed all over from such boasting and bowed his head in embarrassment. Magnus slapped him on the back and told him not to be so modest. The girl laughed happily and said that it was not at all like Glance how he could defeat a monster with such an attitude. Of course, everyone supported Mel, and the guy himself was no exception either. But Magnus was pleased, smiling. He thought that such a friendly atmosphere was the best. Everything should be fine. Suddenly, Mel moved closer to the big man and hugged him by the hand. While Glance was surprised, the girl said that she really appreciated that he went to such lengths for her. The guy thought thoughtfully that apparently this guy was so gloomy from the very beginning because he did not think that he would return alive. Well, it still didn't matter, because Magnus would never be able to understand such people anyway. Seeing this romance, the guy decided that upon returning to La Costa, he would definitely go check out area. The village celebrated this event all together. Everyone ate, danced and dusted. Of course Glance was at the center of it all, as was Magnus. Village girls approached the guy and offered him a drink, and when he refused, they offered juice. Sweat when they started pouring juice to him, the head of the village came up to him. The old man said that he really wanted to give the guy any reward, but he was afraid that in such a poor village there was nothing that would interest the great magician. The guy thought that he really did not need anything. He would even be uncomfortable if they gave him because he is not poor. The guy smiled and said that he had already received his reward, to which the head of the village asked what it was about, to which the guy smiled and said that these were items from the boss. The old man bowed and thanked him, and he thought that what he said was not even a bluff. This thing is what he aspired to from the very beginning. According to the book, there was only a 79% chance of an item called the heart of the rattlesnake forest falling out. And right now, he was holding this item in his hand. He was going to give this item as a material to a blacksmith for something he wanted to create. When they defeated the enemy, he took out this thing and asked Glance if he had collected everything. Of course, he has already collected the fragments of his shield, which broke during the raid. The guy then thanked the big guy, what surprised him. But Magnus was going to get a new magic item with the help of the fragments of the shield in the heart of the rattlesnake forest. When he said that it was a help in his future battle with the demon king, Glance scratched his cheek in embarrassment. Now the guy just had to find a mystical blacksmith, and of course everything was in the book of the world. The guy went to the important people section and found the mystical blacksmith Bazarf. All the preparations were made, so the guy returned to Lacusta and went straight to the blacksmith. When he knocked, no one answered, and he was furious because he had to leave even area alone in order to come here. When he started banging on the door, it accidentally opened itself. The surprised guy came in and said that it was bad because the old man might get angry. But when he came in, he saw the devastation, and the blacksmith himself was lying on the ground. The shocked guy ran towards this gnome wondering what the hell happened here. In Bezif's workshop, everything was destroyed and lying around. In the same place Magnus saw a blacksmith lying on the ground, beaten and bruised. He anxiously helped Tom up and asked what had happened here, to which the blacksmith could only say that they were heroes. Looking at the poor blacksmith's face, which was covered in bruises, the guy clenched his teeth in rage, asking if it was really Eugene's group. 
Did he really get so brazen that he started attacking people? The guy took out a bottle of a health potion, told Basurf to drink this potion faster because it can help. The blacksmith pushing the guy away said that he doesn't take anything for free and he doesn't trust people. Looking at the dwarf, the guy thought that this should be the eccentricity mentioned in the book. Sweating all over, the blacksmith said that those people told him to make a weapon and then robbed him. They behave like bandits, but they are still called heroes. The guy hearing this thought that probably this is not the worst thing they did. Seeing Bazarf's sullenness, the guy turned around in search of something suitable and soon saw a spear in the wall, and stood up, he pointed at it. It was a thunder trident of rank B. The guy smiled and said that if so, could the blacksmith sell this spear? Then he said that he would have paid 8,000 gold, but he didn't have that kind of money with him. Of course he could go back to the hotel, but somehow he didn't want to. Then can they exchange? This is a high-quality potion, on a blacksmith's spear. Grinning, the blacksmith looked at the guy and said that he understood, and then taking the potion, thanked the guy for it. The guy smiled and introduced himself as Magnus the Magician. After drinking the potion, the dwarf thanked Magnus, and then he beamed all over. The effects of the potion were immediate. Getting up from his seat, the blacksmith began to shine with cheerfulness. Raising his head, the blacksmith looked at the guy and asked him what brought him here, and then narrowing his eyes pointed to the trident and said that the guy did not say that a magician like him might need that spear. The guy appreciated the joke and laughed, and then calmed down, straightened up and said that he had heard that Bazurf was the best blacksmith in the neighborhood while at the expense of helping him create a magic item. The surprised blacksmith looked at the guy and he said that he hoped that the blacksmith would agree, and they would immediately proceed. Valuable of course will be that potion. Laughing, the blacksmith said that's why the guy came to him, and then said that since he saved him, he would make a discount. Magnus was delighted, but Bazurf raised two fingers and said that now he owed two of the same potions. After his words, the guy fell into a stupor for a few seconds, and then looking at the old man, said that's why the dwarf has such a huge belly. He grinned and slapped his stomach and the prince said that he looks good, doesn't he? He used to be such a womanizer. After some thought, the blacksmith said that even if he agreed, he couldn't help Magnus. That bastard hero stole his beloved hammer while smiling nastily and saying that they would return it as soon as they defeated the demon king. The guy looked at the old man with an expressionless face and asked if maybe then he would find a new one. Basurf stroked his beard and said that if a blacksmith is compared to a magician, then for him an excellent hammer is as important as for a magician to have a good magic staff. If he does not have a great hammer made of adamantium or mithril, then he will not be able to create high-quality items. The guy took out the book and thought that if everything was like that, then all of Eugene's efforts were in vain. While he was reading looking for something, the blacksmith also became curious and he wanted to peek. Finally, the guy found the right section of items and the blacksmith asked him what kind of book it was, what he was reading there. The guy closed the book, said that he would explain all the details later, and then smiled and said that it looked like they had a chance to get an Orichalcum blacksmith's hammer. After a while, the guy was already flying with Aria on a carpet plane, with an unusually fast speed. Aria looked at the guy with a smile and said that they were lucky that the guy was able to borrow a magic carpet from the association. At this rate they would get there in two hours. The guy smiled and said that it was very convenient. And then looking at the trembling old man in front, I asked him if he didn't think so too. The blacksmith shrank covered with cold sweat running down his face and hardly said that it was so. He took a task from the head of the merchants, as well as part-time Aria's father. He smiled and said that a huge accumulation of rare metals had been discovered in the great Megaro's mine. Somewhere there is also an Orichalcum blacksmith's hammer. This assignment was from the ruler. Of course the guy agreed. The trembling blacksmith asked the guy if everything would be alright because that place is teeming with dead people. To this, the girl smiled and said that if Magnus was with them, then everything would be fine. And the guy himself licked his finger and said that no matter what happened, they should, no, they must get this hammer. After a while, they were already at the entrance to the great Megaro's mine. Looking at this huge entrance, Magnus asked if it wasn't too big an entrance for a mine. The blacksmith folded his arms under his chest and said that all kinds of resources were mined here before, so it's not surprising that the entrance is so huge. The guy smiled and asked that maybe they would immediately fly there on the carpet. Hearing this, the blacksmith shuddered, and then shouted asking the guy that he still wants to use this unreliable junk. The guy waved away the old man's words and put one hand in his side and said that if there were only one of them, then everything would be fine. But for Aria, it would be difficult because the path there is not small. 
Hearing this, the delighted area rushed to hug the guy with hearts in his eyes. She said she was so glad the guy was worried about her. The whole gloomy old man was covered with cold sweat running down his face, but still told them to do what they wanted. Soon they were floating again with the help of the carpet and rushing forward. The guy noticing the enemies smiled and said that then they would start, but the girl, seeing the dead men, shuddered and turned pale and clung to the guy. With the clatter of bones, skeletons could be seen ahead. A huge number of skeletons were coming to them with armor and weapons. The carpet stopped, and seeing this outrage, Bazarf said that it was the result of human greed. Unable to leave this world, they continue to wander around the mine. These people really were idiots, it's a pathetic sight. The guy looked accusingly at the dwarf and pointed at the small skeleton and said that there are dwarves here. Looking away, Bazarf said that there were only a couple of them here, they were losers and that was all. The guy's staff began to glow and he began to cast a spell. After that, he released the Spear of Manny, crushing the skeletons into halves or into several pieces. The stunned dwarf looked at the devastation, and then at the magician, said that he had destroyed them all. Unlike him, Arya enthusiastically hugged her beloved, saying that it was cool. After that, they sat down on the carpet again and flew forward. When a skeleton was visible on the horizon, they stopped and the guy destroyed them, and then the path continued again. After a while Basserf stroking his beard said that it looks like Magnus is much stronger than he thought. Of course, the magician was proud of the dwarf's statement. Suddenly, at this time, Arya screamed and she screamed all red that there were more monsters ahead, and then clung to the guy. The guy, seeing this sweetness, could not help but shudder and the girl, with the words that she was scared, snuggled even more to the guy. Seeing these lovebirds, the dwarf told the guy to watch the road, and he was all confused, said that it was natural. And then Magnus smiled and said they couldn't get lost anyway, and then he remembered the book and the map inside it. He was able to memorize the entire map of this mine, so he knew where he could go, and where it was better not to go. Some time later, they were already in the mining area of rare materials. Looking around, the guy said that he finally got there, and the girl said that it was so spacious. Only Basser felt himself in his path and pointing to the mine said that although this mine was abandoned, there were still a lot of minerals, although he didn't think those guys would let them do anything. With these words, the blacksmith pointed to the skeletons in the passage. Those with a roar of metal and bones ran towards them. The guy certainly did not wait until they got there and released a spear of mana, crushing them into pieces. Looking at this, the guy proudly smiled and said that it was nothing. An area, who was hiding behind him, said that it was cool, they all disappeared. The dwarf folded his arms under his chest and simply said nothing. The guy began to recite a new spell and soon a small ripple appeared in space, which began to expand into a black hole and soon reached the height of a person. After that, the foot entered from there, and a few minutes later, the mine was filled with miners. The shocked dwarf looked at the portal and asked that Magnus had made a reservation to create a portal from here, all the way to Lacustia, and then looking at the guy, he smiled admiringly and said that he was really amazing. Magnus himself ordered the workers to do this and that. They excitedly clenched their fists and shouted that now it was their job. What were they waiting for? They needed to dig. The knock of the pickaxe on the hard terrain began to resound through the cave and looking at this, the guy excitedly said that they would wait until these workers were finished and then they would return them to the city. In the meantime, they can start looking for the hammer. In the association of merchants of Malma, a blonde-haired merchant, the head of the association and part-time father of Aria, smiled and asked Magnus for a petition for haste. But still the old man was forced to ask the guy about what he thinks about the wedding with her daughter. Magnus, who was looking at his trophies in the form of an aerial hammer, as well as a mountain of money, raised his head in a daze and looked at the old man and asked what the merchant meant. Understanding the shock of the guy, the merchant said that he thinks that the guy himself understood it. But Aria is a very smart girl. She and Magnus are very well suited to each other, so they have every chance to live a long and happy life together. The guy certainly agreed with these arguments, but still, it was a little too much. The guy remembered Aria with her first sentence, and thought that it looks like the daughter completely took after her father. Aria herself, who was standing behind her father in front of the goods, hearing their dialogue, ran up to her father and put her hands on the pile with concern, said that this was not a good idea. The father looked at his daughter without understanding and she squeezed the hem of her dress and said that Magnus would be busy fighting the demon king in the near future. Of course she understands how important this is for him, so she does not want to be a burden to him. Hearing this, the guy shuddered and looked at his beloved. Scratching his blonde beard, Arya's father said that her daughter was telling the truth, that if the demon king destroyed the world, trade would decline. 
scratching his head. The old man looked at the guy with an awkward smile and asked for forgiveness, because he said without thinking. The guy, slightly panicking, said that everything was fine, so he didn't have to worry. After that, the guy looked at the girl with gratitude. The guy mentally said thank you to her. She seemed to feel his gratitude, and therefore smiled very sweetly. Seeing this smile, the guy couldn't help but think that he was lucky, because he met a girl like Aria. A week passed unnoticed and Magnus came to the blacksmith again and asked him about the order, whether he was ready or not. Bazurf smiled and waved to the guy and said that he was just in time, so let him come in faster. While they were entering the forge, Bazurf said that he had spent so much time to collect all those relics to create this, it was definitely his masterpiece. Grinning, the guy leaned over and said to Basurf that it looked like he had tried hard for him, he grunted, but did not answer. Finally, they nailed it in place and looking at this work of art, the guy's eyes flashed with admiration. Right in front of him was a huge armored, or rather metal bear. This was what he had wanted for a long time, a combat magic golem. The dwarf, seeing the guy's admiration, proudly chuckled and said that this was his best work. Putting his hand on the bear's waist, the old man said that he even engraved his name. The name Gladius was actually engraved on the body of this golem. The guy also put his hand on the golem and smiled and said that the work of a blacksmith of the Basurf level is very priceless, so he is very grateful for the work of the blacksmith. With this thing, he will definitely be able to get into the deepest parts of the Megaro's mine. Hearing the guy's words, Bazurf asked in shock what he meant and now some time later they are eating on a gladius together in the direction of the mine. The guy excitedly looking ahead said that it was convenient to ride on it. The dwarf who was sitting in the back said that it was natural who the Bazurf was in the guy's opinion. While the golem was running across the plains, the guy asked the blacksmith about that. What can then test this kid? To which Basurf said that the guy can do whatever he wants, but he should only be more careful. Feeling a rush of adrenaline, Magnus laughed merrily, and while he was having fun, the dwarf, trembling all over, grabbed him even harder. Remembering the mine, Magnus said that they needed to destroy the boss in its depths, and hearing this, Basurf turned pale and covered with cold sweat running down his face. The guy who didn't even notice it continued, saying that it was because of this boss that there are so many undead in the caves. But they had a difference of six levels, so therefore the battle will be very difficult. But everything is fine. The guy slapped the gladius, turned around and told the blacksmith that if this guy entered the game, then everything would change. This boss will also be a great test enemy for gladius. The guy smiled and said to the blacksmith that he could just relax. He looked away, said that as the guy knows, then let him do it, and he only hopes that he will survive in this fight. Soon they were nailed to the great mine of Megaros. As soon as they arrived, the guy stormed his golem straight ahead, and while the bear was racing, he himself shot spears of mana destroying skeletons in packs. Seeing that the dwarf was trembling, the guy asked that he might change his mind after all. The dwarf smiled tightly and said that he would love to, but this is the first gladius fight, how can he miss such a thing? The guy heard the gnome and asked if it was really worth risking your life. At the same time, the guy himself was covered in cold sweat, because he knew that he would not be able to protect the dwarf during this fight. This time his enemy is really strong. He would have to concentrate completely on the battle, and therefore he would not have time to defend Basurf. It seems Basurf noticed the tension of the guy and therefore, filled with determination, looked at him and told him to just relax and not worry about anything, especially about him. The guy, seeing the determination in the dwarf's eyes, grinned and said that he was really an unusual blacksmith. Time passed and they finally nailed Megaros into the bowels of the mine. Everything was dark here, and columns were sticking out of the ground. Feeling the oppressive aura of this place, the guy on the gladius swallowed, but still went forward. Soon, a huge bone dragon appeared in front of the guy, who seemed to be sleeping. Seeing him, the guy shuddered, said that this guy was really huge, and then pushing the dwarf away. He told him to stay behind and not interfere. The dwarf who was already behind the stone just nodded. The bone dragon was surrounded by a strange black fog, and looking at it, the guy remembered that the book said that this fog is called miasma. According to the book, low-level adventurers take damage just by touching it. The battle in it often ends in death. When the guy approached the dragon, it seemed to sense him, got up and growled. From the roar of the bone dragon, which was already 34 levels, waves went all over the cave. A second later, skeletons began to emerge from the ground. Seeing this with his own eyes, and not just reading the text, the guy thought that this is how this big guy calls them. The guy immediately gave a mental order to the golem to protect him. Gladius immediately accepted the order and ran up to one skeleton, smashed it with one paw. Seeing this, the guy grinned and said that everything was going according to plan, so everything was fine. 
while Gladius will distract the skeletons, the guy himself will focus on killing the dragon. The guy immediately began to cast a spell, and shadow magic began to form over him. After that, she flew and crashed right into the dragon pile. Of course, after the blow, although the dragon recoiled, it was still in perfect order. Looking at what to do, the dwarf guy did not understandingly ask him if dark magic works for the undead. The guy who was concentrating to the limit shouted to Bazurf to be silent and just watch. After the fog of darkness, stone bullets followed. The bullets crashed into the bones of the skeleton, tore the bones and seeing this, the dwarf said that this was the case, the guy did a great job. The bone dragon roared at the top of his voice, but Magnus, despite this, sent one swirl of dark fog after another in his direction, and stone bullets followed immediately after. Thanks to this combination, the neck of the bone dragon began to be covered with cracks, and it seems that the boss himself felt it, because he began to shake his neck and soon a new head formed and screamed from the spine. Surprised by this, the dwarf was covered with cold sweat running down his face and said that this monster had just grown a second head. Otherwise it could not be called a bad joke. He can be defeated at all or not. After reading the spell, another shadow flew into the monster's head and created a mist, followed immediately by a stone volley. Seeing how the guy was trying to escape the blows of the bone dragon, the dwarf in a panic said that it was useless, but Magnus was firm in his decision and told the dwarf that everything was fine. He just had to believe in him. And after several repetitions, both necks broke with a crunch but immediately another head appeared in the same place, and the previous ones were restored. As soon as the new head was formed, all three heads aimed at the guy shot a dark fog and the guy could only cover himself with his hand, honoring how his skin was corroding, and he himself was weakening. The guy used resistance, and soon a new notification surfaced in front of him, saying that his magic resistance was increased. After that, the guy immediately used his ring and a new notification appeared, saying that his protection was also increased. It was in a rank ring, the very ring of the guardian angel. The fog finally cleared up and the sweating guy shouted that he had survived. Once he has done this, then it needs to be started already. Another shadow flew with the bone dragon, but it didn't hurt him. Well, at first glance it seemed so. The dwarf asked the guy what he was doing, and Magnus grinned and told him to look carefully, and when the dwarf looked in that direction, his pupils narrowed and his eyes opened wide. The guy smiled and said that shadow magic empties the target's mana. The bone skeleton also spent too much mana on summoning skeletons and regeneration. Besides, he faced his spell's head on several times. Now this hit has completely lost mana. When the fog cleared, the skeleton's muzzles appeared. His skull was cracked and there was a black hole in some places. As soon as the guy saw the heads of the bone skeleton, shrapnel from the stones followed. Right behind her is the shadow that swallowed the dragon. The dragon was completely covered by the mist, but soon the fervor subsided, and the fog began to disappear. The guy smiled and said that now the bone dragon will no longer be able to regenerate and summon skeletons. There was the sound of falling bones, and the guy jumped back and avoided the dragon's blow. He said that now this bully can only attack head-on. In the end, he's just a stupid monster that can be defeated with cunning and knowledge. Another volley of stone bullets flew towards the skeleton, breaking its jaw and body. The skeleton growled angrily and staggered to the ground. The guy smiled happily and triumphantly raised his staff and said that in the end the victory belongs to them. New levels immediately followed, and with them magic power, fortitude, reflexes, agility, holy power, agility and endurance rose to a new level. Magnus, with a new staff in his hand, smiled and said that he had finally raised the level. He was now a level 30 mage. Looking at the gloomy staff that the dark aura was releasing, the guy asked about what he had here. Immediately, a new notification popped up in front of him, saying that it was the staff of a fallen dragon, and it had the rank of S putting him on the bed. He sighed and said that it was certainly good, but the problem is that the higher the level, the harder it is to raise it. The top players of the mind oppressed him, and therefore, in order to relax, he decided to lie down. Levels after the 30th were considered the realm of legendary heroes. Looking at his ceiling with a lifeless gaze, the guy wondered if there really were no other ways to raise the level faster. Lifting the book above him, the guy said that the bone dragon appears too rarely to use it to raise levels. Skeletons are not even worth talking about. He will need to kill 10 million to raise at least one level. If he kills 300 a day, it will take him 15 years. It was just a terrible prospect. Slightly rising, the guy thought that maybe it would be better to go on a trip. As soon as he thought about it, he immediately remembered his flight. Sitting down, the guy reading the book said that he could do one of the side tasks 
and get a reward for it. According to this book, the main task is to kill the demon king, and other tasks can help in different situations and they are called side tasks. For example, there is also a task with a monster, because of which a village girl was sick. There were a lot of inscriptions in the chapter of side tasks. There was exploring a secret cave, helping someone with a potion, helping to kill vampires. Sighing, the guy got up from his seat, and thought that a lot of people are in danger because of the demon king, so he should do everything possible to help them, and along the way he can level up and get a couple of treasures. At this time, Eugene's furious voice rang out in the Narsa's mansion. He was completely enraged, from which even brooms appeared from behind his forehead. Throwing the flowers, he shouted about what it means that Narses no longer needs items for the quest. Narses was adamant, and did not even blink at Eugene's cry. Putting one hand in his side, Narses said that these flowers were simply no longer needed by him. While Eugene's group was digging for a month with this task, one good person had already helped him. Varys was a scientist, and therefore he was cold-blooded. Looking at Eugene with an indifferent look, the guy said that the man had brought him so many flowers that he had already managed to conduct all his experiments. Moreover, there were ingredients now, too, so if he thinks about starting new experiments, they will be enough. Eugene was not satisfied with this answer, and slamming the table even louder shouted that they had risked their lives for a whole month to get these fucking flowers. Nuri's himself should know that they grow in the deepest parts of the Great Gorge, so what the hell? He refuses to pay. At this time, Misha looked at Eugene, who was breathing heavily, and squinted with displeasure, thinking that they had managed to forget about the task at all. If Hilda hadn't accidentally seen the flowers, they wouldn't even have remembered. But of course Eugene didn't even think about it. Eugene could not take everything so easily, and therefore angrily asked that the bespectacled man tell him which bastard dared to steal the quest from him. The scientist smiled and said that it was the great magician Mr. Magnus. When Eugene heard him, he was furious. His vein was so swollen that it seemed he was about to burst. Looking at the scientist, the guy said that really this is the same garbage. Grinning, the scientist folded his arms under his chest and said that Eugene was wrong here. Mr. Magnus is different from ordinary warriors. He is not only much smarter, but also works more efficiently. At these words, Narses looked at Eugene with a bit of arrogance from which he, having become enraged, once again slammed on the table and shouted asking if this scientist was really laughing at him. How can any magician be better than a warrior? Grinning, the scientist said that work proves much better about abilities than words. As Eugene himself sees, Magnus coped much faster than him. How can he justify himself now? Eugene finally couldn't stand it this time. He hit the table with all his might, which caused the table to break on the floors. But Eugene, not even paying attention to it, in a fit of rage began to shout that Narses shut up, because a warrior doesn't need excuses. Team Eugene looked at him with concern, then with fear, then just like that. But Narses was not pleased with the behavior of this warrior, and now looked at him with outright contempt. Trembling with uncontrollable rage, Eugene grinned and began to take the sword from its scabbard and said, Narses, that he dares to mock the warrior, he hopes that the scientist thought about the consequences. Seeing this nonsense, Misha sighed heavily and closed her eyes, thinking that this was already happening again. Since Magnus left, Eugene has been going crazy more and more often. Frowning, the scientist stood in a pose and clenched one fist and asked Mr. Eugene that he really dared to attack the royal scientist whose family has served the crown for seven generations. He might need to report this to his highness. Doesn't Eugene think so? Hearing his words, Eugene turned pale with a start and his legs staggered. Covered with cold sweat running down his face, Eugene immediately retreated, and then Hilda supported him, telling him to cool down. Then the girl said, Mr. Narses, that it was just a misunderstanding. Sweating all over, Eugene also smiled tightly, bowed his head and awkwardly scratching the back of his head said that it really was just a joke, he asks for forgiveness from Mr. Narses. The scientist smiled and said that since it was just a joke, then everything is fine. After his own words, the guy deviated, could not restrain his loud laughter. Sweating like hell, Eugene thanked Mr. Narses for his understanding. The cat girl looked at the captain with a thoughtful expression, and Misha with regret. Two hoped that Eugene had learned a lesson from this. It would be better if he became more patient. Of course, Eugene had not learned anything and now he was furious. He barely, Leviathan restrained himself by calling Narses and Magnus and shouting that he would not forgive them for this. The girls in the group clearly pulled away from him so as not to accidentally get it, and then suddenly a boy running along the road accidentally bumped into him, which made the enraged Eugene unable to stand it hit him with all the dope on his stomach with his foot shouting that this freak seemed to want to die. The boy's small body flew towards the wall and crashed to the ground. 
Seeing this, Misha anxiously ran to the boy, shouting that Eugene had gone too far. Picking up the boy, the girl said that he was injured and asked Hilda to treat him. But as soon as she turned around, she saw the disapproving looks of those around her. Someone from the crowd asked if others had seen it. Someone asked if it wasn't Mr. Eugene. Is it normal that a hero beats a child? Another person said that it's also that his friend works in an armory and he constantly complains that heroes steal goods. One woman asked that they were definitely heroes, not thieves, since they were doing this. One of the girls said that her sister told the same thing. Every time the heroes ordered food at her tavern, they always left without paying. Another immediately picked up the general conversation, said that his friend told him that he had seen the heroes yesterday. Eugene was beating up some kid because he didn't like his face. Others of course said it was a horror. Someone asked if heroes shouldn't help people. Suddenly someone said that no matter how you look at it, Mr. Magnus is several times better than them. One man supported the speaker, happily saying that thanks to his potion, his wife finally got rid of the curse. Another girl clapped her hands and happily said that her mother idolized Magnus. He helped their village get rid of the vampires. The conversation was supported by someone else, saying that there are rumors that Magnus was also able to defeat the dragon living in the depths of Megaros. After hundreds of years, the bone dragon was finally defeated. Seeing this, one blonde man said that he had once heard that the king was so delighted with Magnus that he offered him to become a nobleman, but he refused. The surprised woman grabbed her face and asked about the fact that he refused to be drunk. The old lady said that Mr. Magnus said that because of his main mission, he could not belong to one country. Someone else said that he was probably the complete opposite of Eugen, and who is really the hero here. While Hilda was treating the child, Misha listened with admiration to the words of the townspeople, thinking that Magnus, after leaving the group, seemed to be trying only harder, helping so many people. With a regretful tilt of her head, the girl smiled sadly and thought that she must have been so rude to him. She hoped that he was okay. While she was thinking about her own, the whole trembling Eugene said that a magician could not be better than a warrior. Seizing the trembling hand of the other, Eugene said with great rage and malice that he was better than Magnus. He would show everyone who was better. From such tension, the whites of his eyes turned bloodshot, and the veins around swelled. Stroking the bruised boy, Misha thought that it looked like after this incident, Eugene finally had an incentive. She thinks that's exactly what he needed as a warrior. In Nars's mansion, the scientist smiled broadly with a scroll in his hand and thanked Magnus. He was very grateful to this guy for everything he did. Magnus smiled and put one hand in his side and said that it was not worth it. Helping nurses, he was helping a lot of people, so he should thank the scientist. Smiling, nurses said that then if the guy has any problems, he can apply. The guy smiled tightly and looked away, asking Narses that he was definitely a scientist, not a merchant. Narses, without answering anything, put the scroll on the table and said that he thought the guy had already heard about it, but he would tell anyway. The heroes group went to fight with Derwin Watt. The surprised guy asked if it was really true. Magnus frowned and remembered the information about this monster. It's the damn general, Derwin Watt. He lives in the mountains on the border of Lacusta and is one of the eight generals serving the Demon King. In addition, he is a 40-level maid. Adjusting his glasses, the scientist said that he was sure of it. Before that, they raised a fuss and announced to the whole city that they would defeat him. That was three days ago. Frowning, the guy thought that Eugene, as always, was an idiot and remains an idiot. Durbanvot's special ability is binding, and thanks to him, the monster can immobilize two people at once if their level is below 32. Thanks to side tasks, his level was already about 32, but Eugene's group could not raise the level so much yet. Simply put, this is pure suicide. The guy had a difficult choice, because he was not sure that he would win the fight against the demon, but he also did not want his former comrades to die so easily. Due to the strain, he was covered in cold sweat running down his face. Putting his hands on the table, he thought that if they were all killed, then he could only pray for them, but if they were still alive, could he save them? The guy remembered the faces of people who looked at him with contempt and wondered if he needed it. Did he have to risk his life for them? The guy planned to go there at the 34th level because now he is still not up to this. But as soon as he imagined the dead former comrades, the thought appeared in his head about whether he should still risk his life. In the end, grabbing the hair on his forehead, he raised it and clenched his teeth and thought that he was a real idiot. Turning around, he asked for a petition from Mr. Narses and said that he had urgent business. Narses was a witness of the tormented in the choice and therefore quickly realized that he blew out and therefore asked him if Magnus really decided to go after the heroes. The guy stopped, turned around and gently smiled and asked that, as expected, it was stupid, but he just couldn't leave them to their fate like that. 
Narses, hearing him, was stunned, but quickly regaining his composure, said that he could certainly laugh at Magnus, but only after he returned to him with a victory over Durbanvot. Having said that, the scientist smiled and added that he was only 35 years old, so that they could later talk about his exploits over a couple of glasses. Smiling awkwardly, the guy said that he would probably refuse, because he is weak to alcohol. Laughing, Narses said that he would never have thought a great magician could not drink. The guy grinned and said, although maybe a scientist might think that he was joking, but this is far from the case. Suddenly Narses remembered something and turned around and began to rummage through his things, saying that he had something here. This thing should be useful to a great magician. Finally finding the carpet, he said it was their family's treasure, the flying carpet. On it, the guy can get a lot faster. The guy smiled gratefully and said that then he would borrow it from Narses. He gently smiled and nodded, and after a while the guy raced along with his golem on the magic carpet. Looking ahead, the guy thought that he would have to thank Narses later. If Eugene and his group set off three days ago, then he will quickly catch up with them. So, the guy rushed to his strongest enemy in order to save his former comrades. The fortress of the evil cursed General Durbanbot was pitch black, and the air here was heavy, as if in hell. Above the fortress there was a whirlpool of clouds all the time, from which there was thunder and lightning constantly, and only these signs of the fury of nature illuminated for a moment this gloomy place. Only a narrow ladder led towards the castle, and on the sides of the path there were needle-like protrusions with a sharp top from the ground. Having reached the main entrance, Magnus opened this huge door and looked at the gloomy hall inside the castle. Right in front of the guy was a statue of a demon, and on both sides there were stairs to the second floor. The guy, looking at this great hall, was filled with even more firmness. The book said that even the weakest creatures living in this fortress reach level 10, 13. So Magnus did not think that the time he would spend here would be similar to the time he spent in the Megaro's mine. That's why he has to defeat all the opponents in every corner of this fortress before going forward. With this intention, the guy began to clear the castle of demons and demonic creatures. Immediately after his entrance, fireballs flew into the enemy with stone bullets, and after leaving the room, only corpses lying on the floor remained in it. Walking along a long corridor, the guy thought that these corridors seem very familiar to him. It feels like he is stuck in a maze. Trap after trap, they're everywhere, right on every corner. Because of this, the guy got the feeling that this place is not a fortress, but an exhibition of traps. Smiling, the guy took out his book and said that in any case it would not be a huge problem for him. In the book, he quickly found chapters on detecting traps and chapters on avoiding them. The guy, knocking on the wall, walked forward very carefully. So far, only the ringing of metal on a hard surface could be heard on the wall, but suddenly another sound was heard, as if it wasn't a solid wall but something else. The guy realized that this was the place he was looking for and putting his hand there gave Durbanbot, Sama the honor, and then the surface of the wall in this area came forward, and then moved to the right and opened the way. The guy smiled and said that this was the secret way, with this he would save a lot of time if he went through it. The guy smiled awkwardly and thought that this password sounded a little pathetic. That's when they passed through it and were walking forward, suddenly someone appeared in front of them. It was a huge spider-shaped mithril golem of 26 level maids. Looking at him, the guy said that it looks like the defender of the secret corridor has finally appeared. Grinning, the guy thought that he had read in the book that this thing has the maximum protection to magic, so he must be a nightmare of magicians. But it's good that he has a gladius. Gladius, on the orders of his master, came forward and ran straight at the golems on four paws and grabbed him, already with two paws. While the two golems grappled, the magician began to conjure over the strengthening of his comrade and Gladius was enveloped in light. Before the magic worked, Gladius was pushed back. But as soon as the guy finished the spells and Gladius raised the holy defense, defense, fortitude, agility, and agility, then even a strong blow from the opponent did not even scratch the golem. The bear got hit in the face, but his face was not even slightly dented. But when he gave the task, the enemy barely restrained himself. The guy looking at the battle of the two titans bookings could only support his comrade with words and buffs. The next buff was armor piercing and freezing, and after the enemy was removed, the golem froze in place, and his hands were shackled by ice spikes that came out of the ground. The guy smiled and said that even though the resistance of the monster is at a fairly high level, but the magic of ice can still slow it down and deprive it of maneuverability. A whirlwind of frost and snow enveloped the enemy golem, and the guy looking at his frozen ice statue could only grin. Unable to restrain himself, he asked the enemy if he knew that right now he looks like a spitting image of an ice golem. 
Gladius considered this a chance, got ready and began to fill the paw with energy, which caused it to glow with a bright light. And then a huge paw crushed the enemy golem that fell split into two halves, and Mithril Orr fell out of it. Looking at the huge loot, the guy happily smiled and said that as he had given birth from the boss, his gut had never failed him yet. This boss dropped a whole bunch of super rare items. Taking out his magic backpack, the guy began to collect his loot from the ground, thinking that this magic backpack is a convenient thing, because you can store a huge number of items in it. Finally having finished with the collection, the guy happily smiled and thought that the side task of this palace was completed. The guy reached the spiral staircase and started climbing up it. Raising his head, the guy asked what it means that the fortress has at least five floors, however, as expected from the palace of the demon general Durbanvot. Finally, he reached the fifth floor of the Durbanvot fortress and began to step through its corridors. The guy suddenly noticed an unfamiliar seal on the ground and stopped and took out a book to check what it was. While he was testing the knowledge, some people appeared behind the column. Turning around, he saw those for whom he had come. Smiling, the guy said to Eugene that to be honest, it was too easy to get here. The stunned Eugene, who was covered in blood and crumpled, looked at Magnus in shock and then, coming to his senses, shouted furiously asking what the hell he had forgotten here. Sighing, the guy folded his arms under his chest and said that he had come here to defeat the evil cursed General Durbanbot, of course. Nisha, who was also covered in abrasions, happily smiled and said that then they had the same goal. And then looking around, she asked the guy where his team was, with whom he came. The guy proudly raised his head and said that he had no teammates. The surprised girl asked the guy what Magnus meant and he happily slapped his golem and said that he meant that he came here alone. Although if you think about it, he's not alone. This big guy is with him, too. That's what he can call a comrade. Then the guy introduced this kid named Gladius. Eugene, hearing him, turned pale and asked if it was really true. Hilda, too, not believing it, said that this could not be. The cat in the team also scratched her head and added that it was impossible. It should be added that all of them were unnecessarily badly dented. Turning around, the guy looked at them and said that he knew they would say so. Well, if so, then he has no choice but to go his own way. With these words, the guy turned around. Then Hilda came out of the hero's team all pale and shouted for the guy to wait a second. She was so desperate that Magnus stopped anyway. Kneeling on one knee, the healer folded her hands in prayer and said that she meant Mr. Magnus, and not just Magnus. Then the girl asked him if Magnus could help them and join their group in order to fight against the enemies with them shoulder to shoulder. Not only Magnus himself, but also Eugene and Misha were shocked by Hild's behavior. But she was inimitable. Smiling, she blushed and said that in the end, Durbanvod is the enemy of all mankind. That's why they have to unite to defeat him. This way they will have more chances. Bowing her head, the nun added that she also hoped that Magnus would return to their team. This was the last straw in Eugene. Unable to restrain himself, flew into a rage and shouted at Hilda not to decide for herself. But Hilda didn't even listen to him, asking if Magnus would fulfill her request. Hilda closed her eyes in anticipation, and Eugene and another two began to look with expectation. But Magnus turned away arrogantly declared that he refused and added that it would be stupid if he joined them. The surprised girl trembled with clenched teeth, but Eugene was more stunned than her. After being stunned, rage came to him and he trembled all over with swollen veins. Going forward, Magnus said that he had spent a lot of time talking to them, so he was a couple. While he was leaving, Eugene called him, to which the guy coldly asked what else they needed. Grinning, Eugene pointed at the guy and said that he was a jerk, but he hot knows what he's standing on. On the fifth floor this pattern appears in almost every place. The guy looked at the pattern of the skull under him and turned nodded and said that it was really so, he didn't even notice it. Grinning, Eugene put his hand on a pothole on the wall and laughed and said that they had already got into trouble before because of such things, so he is well aware of how the local traps work. Misha screamed for Eugene to stop, but he made a face and laughed loudly, said that he would now show the guy how the traps work here and press the pothole. The floor under the guy disappeared and therefore he fell straight down. Looking down, Eugene shouted to Magnus to listen carefully to him. An ordinary wizard will never become stronger than a real hero, and with that he laughed out loud. Raising his head, the guy looked up, and then scratching his head said that it looked like Eugene wanted to end it with him, and then the guy grinned and laughed out loud. Smiling, he said that he should thank him, because he just needed to get here. Shortly before that, Gladius also pressed the switch, but then one switch was activated, but the trap did not activate. Then Magnus started to worry, but now everything is fine. The guy began to rummage through the pile of the skeleton and finally found what he was looking for. It was a magic item. He is very necessary in order to defeat Durbanvot. 
After he finished with his business, the guy cast a flight spell and flew back up with lightning speed. Smiling, he said that his goal was the top floor. Right now, on the top floor in the throne room, a group of heroes has finally reached their intended location. Right in the center of the hall, a monster sat on a throne. He smiled and said that the heroes could accept his congratulations as a sign that they were able to go so far. This monster, or rather demon, was the cursed General Durbanvot. Looking at him, Eugene clenched his teeth and shouted that he had no desire to accept praise from such a rotten asshole as Durbanvot. The damn general smiled and said that no, he really should praise them, because they deserve it. The warrior and priestess are level 22 maids, the fighter is level 20 maids and the last hero is level 19 maids. They definitely deserve praise for the fact that despite their insignificance at the level of insects, they were able to go so far. Enraged, Eugene shouted that they were called insignificant insects. Interlocking his fingers, Durbanbot cheerfully said that especially if you look at their levels and status, isn't it obvious? Sometimes a person is simply chosen by fate, but the hero has incredible luck since he survived with such a level. After that, Durbanbot laughed out loud. Durbanbot smiled and told the hero to become his servant, and then half of the kingdom of Lacusta would belong only to him. Surprised, Eugene smiled happily with a red face and asked if it was really true. Seeing Eugene's reaction, Hilda and Misha's face twisted and they turned pale. Grinning, Durbanvot said that the demonic lord had ordered him to convey these words, but he himself did not need such garbage as Eugene in subordination. Durbanvot generally thought that such trash as Eugene should die here and now. When Eugene heard him, he was stunned, and then, enraged, he shouted that he would kill this demon. Immediately Hilda cast a spell of support, and Eugene's sword filled with fire. Misha and the cat immediately followed him. A new notification popped up in front of the guy, saying that his strength, defense, endurance, agility and agility were hung up. With these buffs, the hero bent the demon to the side, and after him, the cat, fighter along with Misha bent down. Durbanvot didn't even flinch, raising his hand, he just used the wave, stopping Misha's blows along with the cat. Standing to the side, the hero raised a sword shrouded in a fiery whirlwind, shouted loudly that he would kill the demon, and a new notification appeared in front of him, saying that the hero's unique skill awakening of weapons was activated. This skill showed the true power hidden in weapons and armor. A volley of the flaming sword flew towards the demon's raised hand, and as a result, the hero's sword broke and flew to the side, and the hand was not even scratched. Looking at the hilt of the sword, Eugene turned pale and covered with cold sweat running down his face and said what the fuck happened. Laughing loudly, Durbanvot asked if there was something wrong with this little hero. His sword is made of low-quality material or something. The guy, remembering Bazurf, said that this could not be. The Sword of Flame was forged by the best blacksmith of the Kingdom of Lacusta, he is sure of it. Yes, he forged it right in front of Eugene's eyes. At this time, Misha rushed and hit the demon's paw, but he ignored the conversation, asking the hero that if so, then what is the name of this sword? Eugene did not understand what he asked the demon what Durbanvot meant. He smiled and said that when the best blacksmiths forge their best swords, the crowns of their creativity, they put their whole heart and soul into them, and the blacksmiths engrave a name on them. Trembling, Eugene said that nothing was engraved on it, not a single word. Hearing this, the boss laughed loudly waved his hand and broke Misha's baton, saying that then the hero's sword is a second, rate sword. At this time, the cat also attacked with its claws, but there was not a trace left on the monster's paw. Smiling, the demon said that against someone who is above 30, level maids attacks not impregnated with magic are ineffective. They would do well to remember this. Tired and wounded, Misha and the cat breathed with difficulty and looked at the boss. Looking at the Durbanvot, Misha frowned thinking that for all their attacks, they did not cause him any damage. His strength is simply unimaginable. Looking around, Durbanvot asked about that. That there really isn't a single magician in their worthless gang. It really squeezed, they even have an inferior team. Raising his hand, the monster asked Eugene that he was listening to him. The hero looked at him, and then the monster hit the hero with a schlaben and he flew away, spun in the sky like a bundle, and hit one of the columns. After looking at the hero, Misha and the cat were in shock, and Hilda barely kept herself in hand. The hero was all beaten up. Hilda immediately ran to him saying that she would heal him right away, but he grabbed her by the hand and told her to run away right away. Hilda, stunned, looked at him in a stupor, and the cat and Misha were at a loss. Seizing Hilda by the hand, Eugen ran away screaming that he had only her left. They should run away from here together as far as possible right now. 
Hilda, stunned, asked the hero to wait, but he didn't even listen. Watching the two of them run away, Magnus and the cat were shocked. Misha, with a pale face covered with cold sweat, realized that Eugene had been a coward all this time. There was loud laughter in the hall, and Durbanvot said that this guy was called a hero. They must be kidding. While the demon was laughing, Misha accepted fate, but the cat was trembling with fear. Smiling, Durbanvot said that well, now, he should properly enjoy all of them. Misha and the cat turned around, said that they had taps, and meanwhile Durbanvot brought out his hand showing a thorn. The hand floating in the sky opened its five eyes with six pupils inside. The general stretched out this hand towards the girl said that sitting so long in captivity, he was terribly tired of doing it himself, so the girl should be sure that he fully uses them. The claws on the hand opened and the tentacles came out and the first thing the hand grabbed the cat, and the tentacles on the fingers headed in her direction. From this, the cat turned pale all over and was covered with cold sweat running down her face and seeing these creepy tentacles screamed at the top of her voice. The demon, seeing the cat roaring, said that she would not be able to resist his fist tentacles if she was not at least at level 32. Tenekli slid down where it was necessary, and the cat screamed harder, shouting so that he would not slide down there and push this thing there. Of course, Misha was also a witness to this scene. She flinched at the sight of her comrade, but right now there was another hand in front of her. The girl trembled all over and started to step back, but soon she rested against the column and with a pale face told him not to do it. Smiling, the general said that he had reported that resistance was useless, but Misha was in despair, and with tears in her eyes shouted that he should not do it. Closing her eyes, she thought about that, that there is no one who could help her, at least someone, suddenly tentacly stopped and the girl, feeling nothing, cautiously opened her eyes covered in snot. She saw that the hand had stopped, and the general was looking at the new man in front of him. There was a magician standing next to the door, and next to him was a huge golem figure. The girl looked at Magnus in a daze and her heart forgot. At this time, Durbanvot asked this brat what the fuck he was doing here, and then noticed that this was a level 32 wizard and told him to become his servant. The guy went forward without saying anything, and when he saw the cat, he only froze for a second, but then going forward stopped in front of the boss. Durbanvot continued, saying that once magically becomes his servant, half of the kingdom of Lacusta will become his. Magnus, taking a pose, said that he refused. Immediately after his words, the general's loud and long laughter rang out in the hall and listening to him. Mia looked at the guy and the general himself smiled grimly and said that the magician was so strong that Lee wanted to die. Then Durbanvot can show him why all people are so afraid of him. Well, after their fun, he asked the guy a couple of questions again. The guy raised his staff and smiled and said that all people are afraid of Durbanvot because he is unbearable. A talker, isn't it? Standing up from his throne, Durbanvot said that he admired the guy's courage. It was the evil damn general, Durbanvot, and he woke up at that very moment. The flying fist immediately went towards the magician, and Durbanvot shouted that this was the first blow. The guy raised his staff and looked to the side thinking that it must be his left stump. Since he is already at level 32, the fist tentacles cannot harm him. It seems that Durbanvot knows about this and therefore simply uses parts of his body for physical attacks. He called Gladius and he immediately stood between the magician and the fist striving for him. The armored bear managed to hold back the blow and seeing this, the guy happily said that it was truly cool, as expected from Gladius. Once again, he lets the guy understand that Magnus can always rely on him, although Gladius restrained the blow. But cracks went through his head and chest, but this gave the guy time for spells, so he took advantage of this moment to form a fire spell. Because according to the book, the weakness of the general's left stump is fire. A volley of flames burst out of the ground and engulfed the flying arm. Looking at this, the guy remembered that the left and right stump are monsters that are at level 35. Otherwise, they are three levels higher than Magnus himself, but at the same time Magnus' status is raised to the maximum, so he discards his weakest attribute magic with the help of a staff of black magic. Seeing that the hand was fried, the guy smiled and thought that he could win. The column of flame began to disappear and the hand fell to the floor and its HP was completely reset. Shocked, Misha said that it was incredible, and General Durbanvot said that apparently, he should not underestimate the guy's magical attacks. The guy proudly smiled and said that the general had not yet seen the coolest. Durbanvot did not understand what the guy asked him what Magnus meant, but he took out his dark magic staff from his magic backpack and began to recite a spell. The hand was filled with energy and rebelled back, turning into a zombified left stump. The guy got this staff from the dragon bone, and it had unique special effects. He was able to control fresh dead bodies and revive them as undead. 
but only once. Because of this, he consumed a lot of mana points and also the undead died if they were not supported. Looking at the hand of the aspiring Durban Vaught, laughing, said that he could not even think that the guy had hidden a trump card in his sleeve. The guy, looking at his hand, thought that an ordinary wizard would not be able to support the summoned undead, because its maintenance sucks out too many mana points, but Magnus will be able to do it without any problems even within one week. Releasing the cat, the demon pulled his hand back. Smiling, he said that he didn't have much free time to waste on some pathetic cockroach. Hands locked in battle and seeing that no one wins, the guy said that they both have the same strength. But what if he adds a couple of buffs to his monster? Raising his sacred staff of the lord, the guy increased the strength, durability and dexterity of the undead hand, and then used freezing on the Durbanvot's hand. Thus, his undead hand easily broke the general's icy arm. Smiling, the guy said that he had come prepared. The weakness of the right stump is the element of cold. As soon as the hand was left without health points, the guy immediately raised his cursed staff and revived this hand as well. The guy raised both hands and shouted that now he and Durbanvot are fighting for real. Both hands flew towards the general, but he easily parried both hands. Well, it seemed to him that it was easy, but his stakes began to break. Seeing this, the monster said that it was impossible, because Magnus is an ordinary person. While Durbanvot pierced his own hands with stakes, the guy smiled and said that the weakness of the general himself was lightning. So the guy immediately bombarded himself and his strength increased threefold. The chances of winning increased, and the attacker mode also turned on, which increased his attack. Lightning began to crackle in the sky, and after reading the lightning spell, snakes formed, and they flew at the enemy. Hot they hit him, but the general was able to stay the target. Seeing this, the guy said that it looked like the nickname of an evil and cursed general, not just a nickname. The general, smiling broadly, said that this man should not dare to underestimate him and flew towards the guy with the keels across. Magnus was able to jump away from the blow and looking at this battle, Misha said that it was incredible. They're both so strong. The poor cat, who also came to her senses, wiping her tears, said that their battle was like a battle between the gods. Another lightning bolt struck the general and his HP became zero, but he did not fall, but remained standing. Moreover, all covered with scars, he laughed loudly and said that it was useless, Magnus was wasting his time. Shocked, Misha and the cat asked that he was still alive, but how was he immortal? Laughing, Durbanvot said that people are really stupid. He is very different from all of them. He cut the heart out of his chest and hid it in one place. Unlike the two girls, Magnus didn't panic when he heard the words of the boss monster, but just ran somewhere. Durbanvot continued, saying that as long as his heart beats, he will remain alive. Smiling, the guy said that it was true, because he was also aware of it. From his words, the general fell into a stupor, and the guy started rummaging in his bag. As soon as Durbanvot saw what the guy got, he was covered with cold sweat running down his face. Magnus smiled and asked the boss monster if it wasn't his heart. Startled, the general shouted asking where he got it from. Then he panicked and told Magnus to stop. He began to beg the magician not to destroy him. Of course Magnus didn't even listen to him and just refused and decided to break it. The demon's eyes filled with blood, but the guy didn't care. The ball crashed into the ground and broke into pieces, and Durbanvot fell dead in an instant. Looking at this, the guy was slightly surprised. Immediately, the guy was hugged by two beauties. Misha happily said that Magnus was amazing, and the cat said that he saved her life. Feeling squeezed, the guy didn't know what to do, and those two kept shouting and shouting that he was the strongest and he was able to knock down the boss alone. The guy looked at Durbanvot and he said with bloody tears that he was not going to die like that. Turning around, the guy said that he was also aware of this. After defeating one of the eight commanders of the Demon King's army, Durbanvant, they returned to the kingdom of Lacusta. Magnus was in Narsa's mansion right now. Smiling, Narsus asked the hero, Don, that he was really tired. Embarrassed by such a title, the guy awkwardly scratched his head and said that as Narsus himself sees, he is tired, although this is a rare sight. When the guy remembered the crowd that surrounded him and thanked him, he blushed even more and said, Narses, that as soon as he appeared in the city he was pelted with a hail of thanks. A few days later, even a solemn ceremony, and now he's completely drunk. Hearing his complaints, the scientist laughed out loud, and when his fun finally ended, he told the guy that after the general's murder, the monsters in the whole Lacusta had greatly weakened. Thanks to this, it has already become easier for simple wars to defeat them. Thanks to this, people's lives have changed dramatically and they are grateful to the guy for this. Although he knew it, but the guy remembering so many people, the weight was covered with sweat. Confused, he said, 
that despite this, he cannot calmly appear on the streets of the city, this is a big problem. A few days later, the guy was called to the castle of the kingdom of Lacusta and here he was going to an outdoor banquet. There were already many nobles and people in general. Of course, Arya went with him. Right now, these two were sitting next to the flower beds. Looking at his beloved, the guy awkwardly smiled and said that she had saved him, and for that he was grateful. Arya clenched her fists, smiling, said that she was the daughter of a merchant. He could leave them to her. The guy remembered how he was bothered by other nobles. Then he felt too exhausted. The nobles constantly praised him, saying that defeating Durbanvat was truly incredible. They expressed their gratitude on behalf of all residents and the like. Then Arya saved him from such conversations by taking an active role on herself. After looking at her, the guy said that she was cool, to which the girl shook her head and said that compared to the exploits of Magnus, it was nothing. And then the girl came up to him and whispered in his ear so that he would be more confident. They both smiled at each other, and then the guy drank a mana potion. Then Arya told him that he was kind of pale, and then she embarrassedly put her finger on her lips and said that if he wanted, he could lie on her lap as on pillows. When the guy heard this, the mana potion he drank immediately burst out of his mouth like a fountain. The mixed Magnus looked away and wiping the potion from his mouth, said that everything was fine. But only her dress would get dirty, although she only got better. The embarrassed girl grabbed her reddened cheeks, and said that since he was talking like that, then everything was fine. Suddenly, a joyful Misha called Magnus and when he turned around, the girl waved to him and said that she was looking for him. Arya immediately stood in front of the guy and asked for forgiveness with a big smile, and said that Magnus was not feeling well right now, so he could talk to him later, couldn't he? Folding her arms under her chest and lifting her chin, Misha told Arya to let her pass. But of course Arya didn't even budge and was also smiling at her. Looking at them, the guy just felt that lightning was flashing between them. A disgruntled Misha asked Arya who she was in general, to which she said that she was Arya, the daughter of the head of the Malma company, and she. Chuckling, Misha said that in order for Arya to know, she should introduce herself. She is Misha Magnus' comrade. Clapping her hands, Arya smiled and said that she was one of those who considered Magnus a weakling. Embarrassed by such glories, Misha lost her cool and said that she didn't think so now, to which Arya said that since Misha had changed her mind, it meant she didn't need to ask for forgiveness so she had to get out. Clenching her fist, Misha said that after Magnus left, she felt an emptiness inside herself, and the group deteriorated in the end. Bowing her head, Misha said that they had caused Magnus problems, so she apologized for it. She is very sorry for what happened then. Arya was still unhappy and grabbed Magnus by the hand. Outraged, Arya said that Magnus should not listen to this, then Misha was also indignant and grabbed the guy's other hand and pulled him to her and asked Arya about what difference it made to her at all. Outraged, Arya said that, so she was his girlfriend, to which Misha looked at her in surprise. Feeling himself between a rock and an anvil, the guy shouted that yes, he understood and forgives Misha. To this, Arya plaintively said that Magnus was too kind. Looking at Arya's puffed cheeks, the guy put his hands on her shoulders and told her to listen to him. It wasn't Misha's fault, he was only angry at Eugene. Remembering him and Hilda, the guy said that it was best to stay away from people like him. It took him a while to realize this, so don't blame Misha for everything. Hearing his words, Misha was glad, but also confused, and Arya puffed out her cheeks, took a breath full of piles and screamed that she understood. And then she screamed again that she realized that the guy had a bad temper. Stomping her foot, she screamed again that she understood and everything was fine and then hugging the guy, she said that if Magnus needed something, she would settle everything. No matter how far the guy went, she would always follow him. The guy, slightly embarrassed, looked at his beloved, and so proudly pointing to herself said that she was the daughter of the largest company of Lacusta. It's convenient very convenient. The guy gently smiled and thanked Arya and said that because he was surrounded by such people, he was already well rewarded. When Misha heard him, she was shocked. Magnus removed her hands, said that he forgives her, and now probably everything. The girl looked at her empty hands, smiled, squeezed them and thanked Magnus. At this time, there was a trampling and when Magnus and Arya turned around, they saw the king being escorted by the knights. The king of Lacusta was dressed in chic dark clothes and he had a thick chic mustache. Looking proudly at Magnus, he said that so here he is the hero, Dono, who won in that inferno. The knights stood aside, and the king approached the guy and said that the celebration could not begin without the guest of honor, so he should go with him. Suddenly, someone shouted at his highness to get away from this guy. 
Turning there, Magnus and the king saw a burly man with a beard and in armor. It was Captain Tenzin of the Night Guard. Behind him were Eugene and Hilda. The captain frowned and shouted that his highness would please listen to him and be careful with the magician Magnus, because he is a Durbanvot. The surprised guy, not understanding what was going on, asked the knight about it, and thought to himself that Eugene and Hilda were planning again. Smiling maliciously, Eugene asked the guy that he even turned pale. Probably he began to lose his identity. To this, the guy drank another mana potion and said that he was just tired. After that, the guy turned his head to his highness and told him that this was the same Eugene who recklessly challenged Durbanvot, and then cowardly ran away leaving his comrades. The king was listening to him, and therefore Magnus turned to Eugene and asked him what he would say to this. Eugene turned pale, covered with cold sweat running down his face and said that he was a hero. He would never have escaped from the battlefield. Eugene then waved his fist and shouted that Magnus would never say such a thing about him. So this is a fake, just a Durbanvot. Grinning, the guy said that even Eugene's gate is not working well. The guy looked at the captain of the knights and thought that he was more worried about Tenzin. People's trust in him is on a completely different level, so anything can happen. Looking at the guy with an arrogant look, Tenzin said that he believed the words of the hero, and there is no doubt that this magician hides a Durbanvot in himself. Tenzin, firmly convinced, told the king, who doubted that he would use the identification skill if he had any doubts about his words. The king can always inspect it. The king looked at the indifferent gaze and their gazes met. Then he still used identification, and as soon as he did this, he shuddered and turned pale with fear, because he saw that the guy had level 36, besides he had 271 points of magical power. Looking at the pale people, the guy thought that Durbanvot was 40 level maids, so that at his expense he did not raise the level badly. Moreover, he concentrated on raising the status. Seeing such a number of magic power, he understands all these shocked looks. Literally, everyone turned pale at once. Seeing this, Tenzin shouted to everyone that now they should see, this is the proof. The king was covered in cold sweat running down his face and staggered away. And Tenzin continued, saying that no one present would ever be able to reach such a level of status. Looking around, the guy frowned. Now it was clear to him what Tenzin and Eugene had bet on. Some great people have reached the 30, made level and above. So it was said in his book, which of course only he knows about. Even the king can see with his assessment that he is actually a man. Probably due to the fact that the agile magician stopped at level 17. It is difficult for his highness to accept the fact that a person could reach such a level and such heights. Then Misha stood in front of the guy and shouted that she had seen with her own eyes how Magnus had defeated Durbanbot, and Eugene had fled from there in fear. He's obviously lying. Grinning, Tenzin asked Eugene that this is how his colleagues think of him, to which he grinned and said that she was just a stupid woman who had fallen under the influence of Durbanbot. No one should take her words seriously. Clapping her hands, Hilda smiled and said that everything was exactly like that. Choosing between the words of a hero and some girl, they all know who to really trust. It's like doubting their great deity Tagan. Everyone looked at Misha with a cold look and feeling it, she was covered in cold sweat. When the disapproving stares were looking at her, Magnus came forward and told everyone to be quiet for a second, there was too much noise. Seeing him, Tenzin grinned, but the guy didn't care. He just said, what's the point of all these games, isn't it easier for Durbanmont to arrive on the spot? That's how he thinks. Tenzin looked at the guy and told his highness to order them to capture the demon here and now and stop making a fuss about it all. The guy grinned and raised his hand and said that since everyone still didn't understand, then he would tell. The demon is here, only Tenzin. Durbanvot is not stupid enough to die like that. First he had to find a selfish person from the circle of influential people of the nation and lure him to his side. Lacusta Tenzin was perfect for this, and at the moment of death, Durbanvot transferred his soul into Tenzin's body. Of course, this turned Tenzin into a powerful demon. Looking at the knight, the guy shouted that he had sold his soul to a demon, to which the latter, enraged, shouted back, saying that how Magnus could slander him. Everyone became quiet at once and concentrated their gaze on the guy who started laughing. Sighing, he said that if everything is so, then it really is a circus. They'll see who the real liar is. Lightning flowed around the guy and the guy said that they were going to find out everything in one blow. And then the guy cast a spell and Tenzin was struck by lightning that flew out of the guy's staff. The shocked king asked what Magnus, Dono was doing. And the cowardly Eugene shouted that he did not want to die and rushed away. After a lightning strike, Tenzin hot and fried, but remained a target. Raising his hands up, he laughed loudly. And then there was a terrible crack and Tenzin began to change in front of everyone. Everyone stared in shock at the knight's changing body. 
he began to swell and eventually turned into a huge monster. Tenzin, who can already be considered a Durban Vop, was level 40 and this monster was standing right in the royal manor. Everyone panicked and ran wherever they looked, but Magnus was standing opposite and preparing for battle. The monster raised his fist and sent it towards Magnus. The magic of instant shock was tied to the fist and it flew towards the guy. Looking at this beam, the guy realized that this blow would be hard to bear. The beam crashed into Magnus and threw him into the bushes. Seeing this, the nobles shouted that it was a demon and ran away even more panicked. The guy barely moved and raised his head. Arya immediately ran up to him asking him how he was. In response, the guy also asked her if she was safe, to which she supported the guy and said that everything was fine. Seeing that the guy is also alive and well, the girl said that if he is also alright, then he will not interfere. The guy smiled and said that this was a good decision, as expected from his partner. Raising his head, the guy looked at Durbanvot and thought that Tenzin seemed to have inherited the strength of a monster. Well, if that's the case, he should get rid of the demon once and for all. At this time, the king, who was covered with cold sweat dripping down his face, fell down and hardly walked away. Magnus quickly covered him up and seeing the magician, the king told Magnus that he was right. And then I asked the magician for forgiveness for not believing. The guy smiled and said that there was nothing wrong with that. He was grateful that then the king did not give an order for his arrest. Turning around, the guy saw Misha and told her to take his highness to a safe place. The surprised girl asked if the guy really wanted to fight alone, to which he said that Misha had no weapons or armor with him. In order not to get into trouble, she must not lower her vigilance. The girl clenched her fists and said that she understood and then raised the king as a princess and shouted that his highness would be under her dusty protection from now on, and Magnus should focus on the battle. The king looked at the girl with a mute face, but said nothing. The girl turned and ran away, and the guy took out his staff, grinning, and thought that now he could do the rest. Looking at the monster, he suddenly noticed someone else. Sighing heavily, the guy asked Eugene about what the hell he had arranged here. Eugene was standing in front of him with a sword pointing towards Magnus. Smiling maliciously, Eugene asked if Magnus still didn't understand. The warrior had a tempered flaming sword in his hand. The guy folded his arms under his chest and said that let's say he understood. But Tenzin is still a monster that needs to be destroyed no matter how Eugene looks at it. Eugene, gaping, laughing nastily, said that he would kill him, and then he would seize the king and the kingdom. He was promised half of Lacusta. Hearing his words, the king and Misha were shocked, but the guy just frowned. Laughing madly, Eugene asked Magnus that he wasn't jealous. Money, power and women now, everything will belong to him. Hearing him, the guy slapped himself on the shoulder and said that of course he knew that Eugene was stupid, but to be so. Enraged, Eugene took a pose and asked about what this insignificant magician was doing there. Now he was going to teach him manners. He had never liked Magnus's self-indulgent attitude in the past. The fallen hero overbalanced with a sword and rushed to the new hero and swung his sword. But Magnus easily blocked the sword with his staff and hit him in the face with his staff. The blow knocked out Eugene's breath and he spat blood, right in flight. Stunned, he raised his head and looked at Magnus in a dazed way. His cheek was swollen, and he was all crumpled, so when he said that magicians should not be good at close combat, he looked even more pathetic. The guy threw the staff into his other hand and thought that he was really just a magician. Only his level was 36th. This guy may be a hero, but so far his level is below the 20th. With this level, he won't be able to scratch Magnus. Looking like a worm from above, Magnus asked Eugene if he was okay. After all, he looked very shitty. From such words, the hero, enraged, grabbed his sword and stood up and began waving it, shouting so that Magnus would not be arrogant, because a magician could not be better than a hero, and now he will know it. But unfortunately for Eugene, Magnus easily dodged Eugene's blows, because for a magician, he was slower than a snail. At the same time as dodging, he struck blow after blow, first in the arm, then in the leg, and then in all other parts of the body. Eugene went crazy, covered in blood, shouting for Magnus to die and at this time all his wounds disappeared when he was enveloped in light. Hilda was standing behind him, so Eugene was more or less confident in himself. While they were fighting, Magnus, surprised, asked Hilda about why she was doing this. Eugene is a man who sold his soul to a demon. Then Hilda, with misty eyes, said that she had said it before. The will of God lies beyond human thought. The same can be said about Tagon, Sama, the angel of God, who chose this man as a hero. A hero is a hero. There is no doubt that even this seemingly stupid act is the will of Tagon, Sama. She can only support her and serve her. Frowning, the guy said that she was a real fan. Reflecting the blows, the guy thought that they both infuriate him. He wouldn't be able to fight Tenzin while these two were bothering him. 
Suddenly Aria called the guy and he turned in that direction and saw her standing next to something. Some time ago, when they weren't at the party yet, the guy informed Aria that Tenzin was an accomplice of the demon. She was very surprised and therefore the guy told her that only he knew about it. Durbanvat will not die so easily, he will probably show up at the banquet. Hearing this, Aria said with concern that it was dangerous. They need to warn everyone. The guy shook his head and said that it was not worth doing. He would take the necessary measures. For one thing, he will also test his abilities. The girl was surprised, but asked the guy to let her know if she could help in any way. Then he asked her about one thing, and that thing was Gladius. Right now, the girl took off the covers from the golem and it ran towards Magnus. In an instant, the bear loomed over Eugen like a rock. Seeing him, the hero shuddered, and Magnus immediately ran towards the monster, thinking that he would finally be able to deal with him. As soon as the guy approached, he immediately released thunder, and the monster in response released his instant shock spell. The guy drinking the mana potion thought that, as expected, the mana consumption is enormous, but it's not a problem to restore it, it's all about HP. If this escalates into a protracted battle, then he will naturally find himself in an unfavorable position. Putting his hand on the bag, the guy thought that he should destroy the monster as quickly as possible. Suddenly, at this time, Hilda's voice rang out. She told Magnus to stop resisting. When the fervor subsided, the guy saw Hilda who was holding Aria by the neck. Smiling maliciously, she asked the guy that he wanted to save her life. Seeing this, the guy asked why they were going so far, to which she said that she could, because her path was ordained by God. At this time, a new voice was heard from the other side shouting to Hilda to take her hands away from Aria. It was Misha, who had already put on her gloves. But before she reached her goal, some zombies blocked her path. Smiling, Hilda said that she had been thinking about it for a long time. Wasn't Misha really an idiot? Moving away from the monsters, Misha screamed for this demon to shut up. Still holding her hands on Aria's throat, Hilda said that it was wonderful. She did not love Misha from the very beginning, because she only did what she looked at the hero. Shocked, Misha asked what this fan meant. She never looked at Eugene. But Hilda was laughing out loud. Turning his head, the guy saw flames rising into the sky. With a huge column of flame, Eugene shouted that he was already inflamed. It was a manifestation of his unique skill. Laughing loudly, Eugene shouted to Magnus not to move, because as soon as he moved that girl would die. Looking at the hero, Hilda smiled gently, and the hero himself rushed towards the golem, shouting for this bear to get out of his way. And now a column of flame was moving towards the bear. The guy squeezed his eyes remembering how he asked Basurf to fix the golem five days before the banquet day. The dwarf asked the guy how much he was willing to pay, to which Magnus said that as much as he would say. Basurf put his hand on the belly of his creation and said what he would do. He'll do it as fast as he can. It looks like this kid accompanied the guy for a long time. The guy smiled and said that it was so. The bear fought with him, so his level has grown. Remembering all the feats that the bear performed, the guy said that he was a reliable companion. Because of the hero's sword, the golem broke into thousands of pieces and flew in all directions. Looking at this guy would be in a dumb state. Worried, Arya told Magnus to fight on, and she would be fine. Misha shouted at her former comrades asking them what they were doing. The guy stood still and watched his friend disappear. He's a magician. The founder of the Leicester Academy once spoke words for those of them who would follow his path. Magicians shouldn't be angry. Anger makes the magician lose his composure. First of all, anger is a sign of immaturity and all magicians should remember this. Clutching the staff, the guy thought that this is why he lived by the same rule all the time, all his life. Therefore, no matter how Eugene or the others treated him, he never got angry and did nothing in response. But Magnus got tired of it. He's had enough. He now realizes that he is still immature. Raising his head, the constellation guy looked at his opponents with veins swollen with anger. While Eugene was raising a new pillar of flame, he asked that Magnus did not want this girl to die. Then he should not move and be ready for death. Aria looked at the constellation guy with tears in her eyes, Misha with shock, and Hilda with a smile. But Eugene with a crazy smile. But before he let go of the sword, a staff crashed into his head, knocking him away. Hilda was shocked by this and turned pale all over, but Eugene fell with blood from his head. Clutching his face, Eugene shouted for Hilda to kill Aria faster, so that this jerk would regret it very much. Hilda doubted it, but Magnus himself said that they were idiots, only they would be sorry. Suddenly something covered the sun and Hilda turned pale. The guy with the dark staff shouted for him to rise up. The veil was removed and Durbanvat appeared. Everyone looked at him dumbfounded, covered with perspiration. It was the undead Durbanvat. The guy grinned at them, and Eugene turned pale all over, saying what the Durbanvat is doing here. 
grinning. Magnus asked that the hero had already turned pale. Yes. Misha was also in a panic and asked about why this monster was here. Magnus had defeated him that time. After running away from Hilda, Arya said that this was Magnus' final weapon. Misha did not understand what the girl asked about. About her about it and Arya said that immediately after the death of Durbanbaugh, Magnus used his fallen dragon staff to turn him into the undead and subdue him. Shocked, Misha said that this is how much money it takes to support him for as many as five days. A person is generally capable of such a thing. Arya nodded and said that's why he was constantly drinking mana potion all this time. Misha looked at Arya and thought that it looks like Magnus trusts this girl. Misha probably doesn't have a chance. At this time Hilda was catching up with Arya again and seeing this Magnus shouted for Hilda to get her dirty hands off Arya. Immediately Durbanbot struck towards Hildi, and she did not even have time to turn pale as she was thrown aside. When the fervor subsided, she seemed all overstuffed and crumpled. She was covered in blood, and the floor was soaked late. Foam was dripping from her mouth. Grinning after looking at her, the guy said that she just fainted. It looks like she was lucky. Turning his head Magnus looked at the stunned Eugene and said that Hilda probably shouldn't look at what was about to begin in fear Eugene started a poster, and snot flowed from his nose. Screaming in panic, he asked about what Durbanvot was doing here and why Magnus was using him. Looking at this bastard with an indifferent face, Magnus asked him that didn't Eugene himself say that Magnus was a Durban bot? Wasn't he ready to fight him then? In a panic, Eugene screamed for Magnus to shut up and not say anything. He can't believe it. Turning to Tenzin, he shouted asking why the hell he lied to him. The monster didn't say anything. Magnus filled his staff with mana and said that Eugene would be killed for his stupidity. After that, the undead Durbanvot went towards Eugene and he did not even move from his place and shouted loudly, roaring in three streams. Having fallen, Eugene shouted that yes, he behaved terribly, but Magnus should stop. They are comrades, they traveled together. The guy made a thoughtful look and asked if they were on the same team, something he doesn't remember. Eugene screamed in fear that he would never contact him again. He swears. The guy with a gloomy face said that it would be fine if only he, but what was Eugene thinking about when he destroyed Gladys, or endangered Arya's life? Hearing the words of her beloved, Arya was confused and looked at him with admiration. Magnus, frowning, asked this Mr. I do what I want why he did it. With trembling knees, Eugene said that he was a hero, a man who was destined to save the world. If Magnus killed him, then the world would be doomed, not if he was ready to take responsibility for it. Sighing heavily, Magnus looked down at Eugene and asked if he had the strength to call himself a harem. And you cannot talk about responsibility, of course he will take it upon himself. He was going to save this world in the future anyway. The Durbanvot necklace pierced the hero's pile and he spat blood posthumously. Arya didn't want to look at it because she closed her eyes and the king and Misha watched the constellation with fear and shock. Magnus himself was completely indifferent. At this time, the monster said that Magnus probably wasn't definitely one of those people who shouldn't be angered. The guy turned around and said that wasn't it. He can't even remember the last time he was angry. An instant shock immediately flew into Magnus, which he reflected with his thunder. Durbanvot's corpse also ran forward and he grappled with this monster. Frowning his eyebrows, the guy said that he, too, should get what he deserved. The dead Durbanvot grabbed the living Durbanvot in his arms and hit him on the ground. Of course, the monster did not stand like a pillar and hit his corpse, but the undead were adamant. Receiving blows, she also gave change. Seeing this struggle, the guy grinned and said that now the couple should finish. After getting ready, the guy started bath at himself and increased his attack fivefold, punching power twofold, and also increased the chance of being covered and finally sent a heavy thunder tuning four to his left hand, thanks to the hold. The ring of the general of the magic fist of SSS rank fell out of the Durban bot. With it, the guy can store magic in his hand. After that, the guy caused a whirlwind of flame with a heavy fire setting and used a hold on his right hand. After that, he combined both hands with rings and also combining two spells, the guy created a gram, flame storm. It was destructive magic of an incredible level. Looking at this stunning magic, Misha asked that thunder and lightning united. Arya said that it was a crimson dragon and the king supported her and said that it was as if he was one of those legends. Raising his fists, the guy used combined magic in an explosive flash. A flash of light illuminated everyone and everyone closed their eyes and only a few could stand with their eyes open to this magic. Finally it was over and in the middle of the garden there was a huge crater, inside which there was not even a corpse. Sighing, the guy approached the crater and looked down. 
Looking at this destruction, the guy grinned and put his hand on his forehead and said that it looks like he really is a person who should not be angry. Suddenly, the guy heard a familiar cry and turned to see Aria rushing straight at him. The girl bent over the guy and said that she was so glad that he won. The herald announced that the great magician Magnus, Sama could enter the audience. It was Lacusta's castle, the audience hall for the king. Going inside, the guy walked along the red road straight to the throne to the king. On both sides at the bottom of the throne were the knights of the kingdom, and there were other people below. Soon the guy was standing right in front of the king. The king happily waved his hand and greeted Magnus, saying that he was their hero. The guy, seeing the agitated king, who squeezed his hand hard, told him to calm down a little. The nobles who were standing below stroking his beard said that yes, for the king himself to greet him like that, he was probably really great. The king himself, not paying attention to others, cheerfully said that Magnus, don't know from this day on, he, the king of Lacusta, is dubbed the killer of the demon king. After that, the king turned to the nobles below and shouted that from today Magnus, Dono was becoming the hero of their kingdom and would eventually receive a well-deserved reward. From now on, their country will respond to any request that Magnus, Dono may need to defeat the demon king. After the excited words of the king, all the people raised their hands and shouted that for the glory of the great magician Magnus, and for the glory of the killer of the demon king. The guy, looking at all this, thought that the deity of Tagon chose Eugene as a hero to fight with the demon king. And on the other hand, thanks to the king of Lacusta, his authority can be compared with the authority of the hero. Clutching the staff, the guy excitedly thought about whether there was something to be proud of more than that. With these thoughts, the guy raised his hand with the staff to the sky and everyone shouted back at him. Not far from the castle of Lacusta, two former comrades were sitting in the fields, and there was a cart pulled by horses nearby. Magnus asked Misha that she would return to her native village, to which she nodded sadly, saying that she thought she could clear her father's name by killing the demon king along with the hero. But from now on, she decided to become more down to earth, and therefore she will continue to defeat monsters for the sake of everyone else. The guy nodded and said that he understood. Then Misha asked about what was wrong with Eugen and Hilda, to which the guy said that they would probably run away. Remembering the day when Eugen seemed to have disappeared, the girl was amazed at his vitality. He really stayed alive after this, are all the heroes so strong? The guy squeezed his hand and said that this guy really turned out to be special. Eugen had a hidden skill called the End of Heaven. He allowed the hero not to die as long as the Demon King would stay alive. Even if it continues to cause him insane pain, he will still have one in R. At this time, Eugene, embittered and with swollen veins, shouted that yes, so that his hero would be sent into exile. It's ridiculous. Hilda was walking in front and she looked at the hero and said that they were lucky that they escaped the death penalty. They must leave this kingdom. Enraged, Eugene asked where the cat was now, did she just run away, to which Hilda said she was now in prison. She was the culprit of various crimes. Eugene, even more enraged, kicked the barrel that got under his foot and broke it. Seeing the condition of her hero, Hilda grabbed his hand and said that she would always be on his side, to which he also said in love that they would always be together with Hilda. Suddenly someone called Eugene and shouted that it was the guy who had kicked his son before. Immediately, other dissatisfied people appeared with picks and brooms, saying that this is a villain who sold his soul to a demon. Even if he is a hero, this does not give him the right to behave like this. There is no place for him in this place, he must get away. Clicking with irritation, Eugene wanted to get his sword, but Hilda stopped him by hugging him and saying that the hero, herself, it's better not to make a fuss here, otherwise Magnus, Sama will come again. When Magnus's name was pronounced, Eugene immediately remembered his death, after which he miraculously survived and turned pale. Eugene was covered with cold sweat running down his face and clenching his fist turned and ran, saying that he didn't like all this shit. Eugene shouted telling Hilda that they should go to another kingdom where everyone would worship him. He's had enough of this shit, he's a hero after all. M12 sighed and said that everything was somehow like that. Misha, with a sad face, asked if the sins of these two would be made public to the world. And she is no less to blame, because she has lost her way. The guy bent down on the ground and took out a cobblestone and told Misha that the main thing is that she did not cross the line. And everyone can make mistakes. And Eugene will be thrown stones wherever he goes. He would rather die than endure this. But with Misha everything is different. The guy threw a boulder over the fence and bent down and looked in that direction. He, despite Misha, said that she should let go of her past sins. Then Misha looked at the guy and asked him where he was going, to which he smiled and said that he would go to Aravan. The girl realized that the guy meant the Desert Empire, nodded, and the guy smiled and began to dig in his bag at the same time saying that he had received everything he needed. 
from the bag. The guy took out a jewel of the heavenly kingdom, red and blue, it fell from the Tenzin, Durbanvat, as well as the official certificate of the kingdom of Lacusta. If he shows it, he will be able to get all kinds of amenities in Lacusta and beyond. Soon Misha also bent down to the ground and smiled and wished the guy good luck, to which he did the same. That's how, after banging their fists, everyone went their own way. After a while, in the Bazurf workshop, the guy bowed his head and the constellation with clenched fists asked for forgiveness for not being able to save the Gladius. Seeing this, the dwarf told him to stop, because Gladius did it to protect the guy. After all, it was created to become a shield. He was created to protect the guy until he collapses. Holding a piece of Gladius in his hand, the dwarf raised his head and told Magnus that now he was a great magician. He should tell Basurf whether Gladius had helped him in this. The guy closed his eyes and began to remember the pleasant moments when the bear defended him and fought with him and gently smiled and said that nothing would have happened without him. It would take at least another year to defeat Durbanvat. Smiling happily, the dwarf said that he was glad to hear this, and then putting his hand on something that was covered with a sheet, he said that then this guy would help Magnus. He will become a shield until he turns into dust. It was a mithril giant golem. Putting his hand on it, Bazurf said that this baby's name was Gladius MK2. It is forged from the souls of two fists and a high-quality mithril. He's a battle golem. The soul of two fists was a synthetic object that fell out of the main part of the Durbanvat. The guy happily smiled at the golem's face and said that here they met again. The dwarf looked at the magic carpet and asked if the guy was still using that unreliable flying fabric. The guy grinned and asked about what the gnome really meant by Narses. Hearing the name Bazurf, with his hands folded under his chest, asked what kind of stupid name it was, to which the guy said, Narses, don't know, who gave him this carpet, asked to give the carpet such a name. The guy remembered the moment when Narses gave him a carpet, and told him to call him Nurses. If Magnus defeats the Demon King and becomes a legend, his name will also be recorded in the annals of history as a vehicle. It is indeed the height of vanity, but for him it will be the greatest reward of all. Coughing dryly, Magnus said that it was something like that. When Bazurf heard him, he said that in this case he would probably never understand this strange type. After the guy left the blacksmith, he headed south from the city center to the central fountain. While the guy was sitting here melancholically and thinking about his own, Arya came up to him and asked him what he was doing here at such an early hour. Hadn't they agreed that they would meet at lunch? Arya, as always, was beautiful in her dress. The guy smiled and said that he remembered their first date, because then she told him that she had been waiting for him since the morning. The girl, embarrassed, said that this was so, but he should not have come so early because of this. They both looked at each other with a loving smile, and then the guy said that Arya was also here today. Arya sat down next to the guy and said that to be honest, she had a feeling that Magnus, Sama would be waiting for her here. Hearing this, the guy said in surprise that the girl seemed to have a good intuition, to which she proudly smiled and said that it was not intuition. The guy looked at her with a question and she turned around with a smile and said that this is called communication from heart to heart. Blushing slightly, the guy felt warm inside and thought that love is really a wonderful feeling. The girl looked at the guy and asked if it wasn't boring to wait here alone, to which he bowed his head with a smile and said that if he was honest, then it was. However, he didn't think it would be too bad. Resting on his hand, the guy continued, saying that it made him realize that he was living too fast. He needs to relax a little from time to time. Aria, who was listening intently, giggled and said that she understood, and then added that she thought the same when she was waiting for a guy on their first date. After all, she was very busy with her daily work every day. After all, she is a merchant's daughter. The guy smiled and said that this wonderful time was a real luxury, to which Aria also smiled and said that it was true. The guy sat down on one knee next to his girlfriend and gently took her hand and said that he was leaving for Erevan tomorrow, but she should have already known about it, but he's still informed. He has a gate, so he will come back regularly and every time he will definitely visit the girl. The constellation girl looked at the guy with complex feelings in her eyes and asked if she could count on at least once a month, to which the guy shook his head and said that it was impossible. This made the girl sad, but sighing, she said that then there was nothing to be done, she understood everything, but nevertheless she would wait. The girl even let out a tear. Seeing this, the guy excitedly said that no, Arya did not understand him correctly. She got excited, and then the whole blushing guy said that he could not stand to meet only once a month, so he would come back every 10 days or even every week, if possible. 
Of course, Arya was delighted with his statement, and after crying, she covered her face and said that she loved Magnus. He smiled blissfully and said that he too. Clenching her fists, the girl said that they should spend today as cool as they can, which of course the guy agreed and said that they could afford it. But then raising his head, the guy realized that it was still early and informed that everyone should be closed at such a time. The girl smiled and said that there are some things they can do at this time of day, isn't there? Then they both bent down and their lips met in a kiss. In the era of an empire, where there were sands and pyramids everywhere, there were cries of panic in one of the castles. Someone said that Yugo Kujiyudan had escaped. The guard ran to the side and said that he had done it again. Damn him. Another guard said he wished they had people like Magnus. Someone else asked about who this Magnus was and that guard asked about whether his friend didn't know the great magician. This is the magician who defeated Durbanvot and asked the kingdom of Lacusta. Another guard, greatly surprised, asked about the fact that the same Durbanvot, which of the eight lords of the demon king. The third guard said that there has been a lot of talk about this magician lately. At that time, in one of the rooms of the castle, a dark-skinned beauty with light silky hair was lying on a four-poster bed. When she heard the guards talking, she smiled and said that it looked like she should get to know this magician Magnus better. The desert was sultry as always, but in the capital of the kingdom of Erevan, everything was different. And right now Magnus was in the capital, in the kingdom of Erevan in the audience hall with the king. At the top, there was a throne on which the king of this kingdom sat. As in the kingdom of Lacusta, there were guards at the bottom on both sides, and nobles at the bottom. The guy frowned and said that he was repeating again. He needed permission to visit the ancient ruins. The king refused Magnus outright, saying no three times and adding that he had never signed up for such a thing. It was the desert king of the kingdom of Erevan. Magnus did not give up so easily and took out the letter and said that he even had a letter from King Lacusta asking for cooperation. The king can see for himself, leaning on his throne of the king. He said that wasn't Lacusta a small country with the same short history. He was the king of the Erevan kingdom, and his words were the law here. The guy squinting did not know what to say and seeing his expression and said that Magnus could serve him, fight for him and die for him. Isn't that wonderful? Hearing him, the guy thought that this king has a strange idea of the beautiful. Then the king shouted that he wanted Magnus to deal with the doomsday gang. They attack his dear vassals and merchants, and then brutally deal with them. With the power given to him by God, he orders Magnus to deal with them. Magnus, irritated by the king's tone, sighed heavily, raised his head with an indifferent face and said that he refused. From such arrogance and impudence, the king of Aravana, having become enraged, sweated all over, and the veins on his face swelled. Then he shouted for everyone to take this wicked man. Magnus did not resist and easily went with the guards to the prison. Night came and the moon perfectly illuminated the desert. Sitting in prison, the guy looked at him through a window stuffed with bars. With regret, the guy said that hundreds of years ago this kingdom flourished and was almost the largest. And now it's even smaller than Lacusta. Sighing, the guy said that he certainly did not understand before, but now he can easily understand the reason for the decline of this kingdom. This king is just too eccentric. While he was sitting and talking to himself, footsteps were heard in the corridor and someone asked Magnus, don't know if he was awake, to which he smiled and said that he was wondering who was going there. Raising his head, the guy saw a young dark-skinned prince with white hair, and a dark-skinned princess with the same blonde hair tied in a ponytail. Both of these two looked at him constellation with a mixture of regret and fear. The princess asked if Magnus knew them, to which he cheerfully said that the honorary names of their highnesses were known even in such a distant kingdom as Lacusta. To himself, the guy thought about what he actually read about them in his book. Smiling, the guy asked these two, so what do they want from him? Both bowed and apologized for their father. The princess said that their father was very rude to the great magician, so they are sorry. The guy smiled and pointed to himself and asked about that that they are not ashamed to have with such a simple wizard like him. The prince, opening the cage, said that they had received a letter from King Lacusta, the demon king's killer Magnus, don't know, there is no reason to disrespect him. Squeezing the cage, the prince said with a shudder that such an unfair conclusion could not be forgiven. Opening some parchment, the prince said that by apologies they meant reasonable compensation. Then he pointed to the parchment and said that it was a permission to visit the ancient ruins that the magician wanted. However, since it is first class, usually only the king can issue a special level permit, so entry to some ruins may be restricted. The guy was not so annoyed, on the contrary. He was delighted and gratefully took the parchment, said that there was nothing to worry about, because 99% of the ruins in Erevan can be searched with a first class permit. The princess smiled and said that it looked like Magnus was well informed, and the prince added that they hoped he would forgive them. 
The guy spread his arms and said that it was not their fault, and he was sincerely grateful to them. If something goes wrong, they can count on his support. Hearing his words, the prince immediately happily decided to take advantage of this and said that if so, then he would like to get rid of the guards of the sword. But before he could finish, the princess interrupted him saying that it was rude. Folding her arms under her chest, the princess added that Magnus, Dona went on a journey to save the world. They should not distract him with their internal affairs. The prince, hearing her, said that the princess was really right, and then he bowed his head and asked for forgiveness in front of Magnus, Dono. Then the prince added that he was sorry that he had not thought before speaking. Then they both smiled and told Magnus, Dono to excuse them for this, and they also added that Magnus could safely study the ruins for as long as he needed. In case of any inconvenience, he can rely on them. The prince shook the guy's hand and said that of course they are not as powerful as the king but they will try to help everything in their power. The guy smiled and said that there should be no problems with this, because he himself can be compared to the whole army. Smiling, the guy thought that next time he would come here to finally get those very items. Somewhere in the kingdom of Lacusta, in a cafe in the fresh air, Aria was sitting and eating sweets. She asked Magnus that in this way, he decided to explore the ancient ruins, to which he nodded and said that it was true, because there are a lot of ancient ruins in Aravan. There are also a lot of unexplored territories. The magic item he's looking for should definitely be there. According to literary sources, it used to be a prosperous kingdom, where fruits were everywhere and ordinary citizens could live in peace. It was the most powerful magic kingdom, where golems, carpet planes, and teleporters were used. After eating another spoonful, Arya asked about the fact that now most of Aravana is a desert, isn't it? and even with strong storms. Of course Magnus also knew about this, it happened because of a failed magic ritual 500 years ago. Then the released mana caused enormous damage and overnight turned the once prosperous kingdom into a desert. Eating the sweetness, the guy said that the totality of those cities is buried in the sand. It also got the name Ancient Ruins. Simply put, the current Arawak kingdom is a bunch of guys who stayed on top of the old magic kingdom of Arawana buried in the sand. They invaded the surrounding countries with the magic items they obtained. The entire surface of the ruins has already been looted, so only the deepest part remains, which is not easy to reach. The magic kingdom, when it lost the advantage of the old kingdom, began to lose the conquered territories. Their borders narrowed more and more, and 500 years later they became an ordinary little kingdom in the middle of the desert. The surprised girl looked at her lover and asked about what she thought or the guy actually knows everything in the world. The guy smiled and said that magicians are somewhat similar to scientists. They have the same inquisitive mind. The girl excitedly clenched her fists and said that she, too, would study the state of world affairs for further trade relations. It would be nice to trade with them. The guy shook his head and said that the current Aravan will not be long for this emperor. Well, he thought so, the prince and the princess must have some ulterior motives. The girl said that Magnus must have already taken care of everything himself, to which the guy smiled and said that this was indeed the case. He didn't have to escape from prison by magic. The surprised girl said that at the same time he would have been considered a simple burglar. The guy smiled and said that wasn't a problem, and he wasn't going to do it anyway. Then the girl asked with interest whether this permission was so necessary in order to search the ruins, to which the guy said that he wouldn't even be able to enter without him. There are soldiers everywhere for observation. Well, this is understandable, because ruins are the main source of income for the kingdom. They sell, for example, permission to explore a small part of the ruins, because ordinary people cannot afford it. The girl looked at the guy with condemnation and said that taking something without permission was a real crime. Her words made the guy tremble and he was sweating all over. In a way, Magnus borrowed all his stuff without permission, and stole all his fortune from the bad guys. Well, he hoped that they weren't mad at him. Then the girl happily clapped her hands and said that then they could thank their highnesses. And then, the girl abruptly made a face with a brick and asked if it was Princess Farah who was not a beauty. The guy nodded with a smile, saying that he could not disagree with this. Hearing this, Arya puffed out her cheeks and glared at the guy, whistling darkly. The guy, seeing this grace, involuntarily smiling, thought that Arya was very nice when she was jealous. Then the guy looked at the girl with gentleness and said that despite everything, he only loved Arya. Hearing this, the girl blushed all over, and with hearts in her eyes, she said confusedly, could the guy repeat it again just a little louder? The guy, confused and all reddened, began to look around and ask that he should say it again. Looking around quickly, he was covered in cold sweat running down his face and yet was able to say that he only loved Arya. 
thinking to myself that this is too much. Tu squeezed the guy's hand and he trembled all over, thinking that she squeezed his hand with such force. The girl also smiled slightly tilted her head and said that she also loves Magnus. Both were holding hands and smiling shyly, and finally Arya asked what the guy would say about Prince Heidel. The guy explaining said that the prince seemed shy, and his behavior was almost not suitable for the crown prince. The surprised girl said that this was the complete opposite of his sister. When the girl said this, the guy interrupted her saying that it was only outside. The girl bowed her head uncomprehendingly and the guy looked hard ahead and said that in fact, he was the one behind the doomsday gang. In the kingdom of Aravana in the city of Karba, here merchants were driving back and forth, and people were washing their heads right on the fountain. On the street, instead of stalls, there were carpets with products. Looking around, the guy scratched his head, not knowing exactly where to go. Ramsey's house was somewhere around here. While he was looking for this man, suddenly someone shouted, telling some woman to make Ramsey come out. The guy looked there and saw two people. One was an elderly nun, the other was a man with a bare torso and a saber in his hand. It was the Doomsday Brigade. The old lady said that she would like to find this guy herself, but she doesn't know where he is now. Clenching his teeth, the constellation man asked with many scars if she knew what happens for disobeying the Doomsday Brigade. Seeing this lawlessness, the guy could not help but stand up for the old lady. Covering her with himself, the guy asked if this guy had any problems. The dark, skinned man clenched his teeth and asked this guy if he really wanted to run into Bazansama himself, to which the guy calmly asked what if yes. From such a frivolous answer, the man shuddered, and then, with a predatory smile, licked his saber and said that then he would introduce the constellation to the young man with his lightning wind sword, which can be studied at level 15, and then with the red hot air sword, which he learned at level 16. After that, this guy spread out his arms and said that after all, he. But the guy was not interested and he interrupted her and said that this was really the case. This indifference made the man very angry, so much so that his veins instantly swelled, and one even burst. The man's eyes narrowed and he immediately used his red hot air sword. Flames burst out around him, and burning blades of wind flew towards the guy. But the guy was calm. He calmly cast a spell and a pillar of flame rose right in front of the man, throwing him back. The bandit with a burnt face was screaming in a heart-rending scream, and his sycophants, seeing him, approached him with concern. Magnus grinned and said that Fire 4 is magic that can be studied at level 31. After the gang of bandits left, the guy smiled and said to the old lady that he was glad to meet her and introduced himself as Magnus the Magician. The old lady folded her arms under her chest and looked at him suspiciously. The guy, ignoring this, still smiling, said that he had come to Karba for Ramsey's help to defeat the Demon King and save the world. The old lady closed her eyes and said that the thing was really big, it had been a long time since she had seen such a thing. The guy happily said that he was grateful for the compliment, and the old lady waved him off with a pinched look and told him not to miss them. The guy finally asked if she would tell him her name, to which she replied that she could be called Nun Klim. Closing her eyes, the nun said that she was sure that the guy was laughing to himself at an old crone like her. That's pretty rude, but he should know that in her youth she was not like that at all. The guy thought that he hadn't said that. The woman looked up and said that it was a stretch to call her a nun, because she had not been to church once in the last 20 years. Now the guy became interested and he asked the nun about how she got off the path. She looked at Magnus in response and said that it was not for her. Those who break the rules are the current churchmen. Grinning, the nun said that in any case, useful and useless people are equally dear to the great god. Laughing, the guy said that this was how she talked about radical things, to which she said with a chuckle that she was talking about enlightenment. The leadership of the church said that they could hear the voice of Boca Tagon because they prayed every day. But even after 40 years, she never spent a day without prayer, she never heard the voice of Tagon, Sami. Being in despair, she was sure that she had done something wrong, which was why Tagon, Sama left her. Therefore, she was thinking of leaving the church and ceasing to be a nun, even though she did not miss prayers. But after leaving the church, she thought that soon she would no longer be able to use healing magic and would become an ordinary person again. However, Tagon, Sama hasn't taken her magic away from her yet, which is quite strange. To prove her words, the old woman showed a light on her hand. The guy smiled and said that it should be so. But then the guy smiled maliciously and said that it was certainly only strange when people from the church did not lie about hearing the voice of God. The old lady smiled in the same way and said that it was really the same thing that she wanted to say. Laughing, the old lady said that she liked this guy, so she should thank him for his help. She didn't like being in debt. The guy certainly did not refuse. Soon they were eating and dusting in a nearby tavern. 
The old lady laughed and shouted that the guy should not forget to eat and drink for one thing. The guy, seeing her drink glass after glass, with a pale face, said that he could not, well, maybe only a little. The old lady laughed and told him not to be so pathetic and to drink decently. Then the guy asked Klim Dono about how she knew Ramsey, Dono or not. The woman bit the beef, nodded and said that ever since she found him, seriously injured, on one of the trips, she saved him and met. Then the woman explained that she often travels, so that's why she decided to visit Ramsey when she passed by Karba. It's been a long time since they've seen each other, but this old man arranges his adventures one, once a year. The guy nodded and remembered the information about this person who was in the book. Ramsey was on the list of important people and he was a former adventurer. Ramsey, as a true adventurer, explored the most complex ruins, which were later named after him. Now he was retired, but his experience and skills are simply priceless. This old man lives in the city of Karba and travels several times a year. The guy was sorry that he didn't catch this adventurer now. The book written by God will definitely describe the general information necessary to conquer the Demon King. There will be very little information about those whose importance is not great. Why Ramsey? Yes, because he has a plan to defeat the Demon King. This is his own strategy. It is logical that if a person is not considered an important person, then no one will be bothered by his destination. The book that is written by God is updated every morning at dawn. If he is going to leave Karba, it will definitely be written about in the book. The guy raised his head and asked the nun if she even knew where Ramsey, Dono could go. The old lady nodded and said that there were only a couple of places. And then, narrowing her eyes, she said that he was really going to chase this old man. In any case, he will be back in less than a month, and also that it would not be better to wait. Getting serious, the guy said that he just didn't have that much time. The old lady said that she certainly has assumptions, but what if they turn out to be wrong? The guy picked up the knife, said that he had the magic of the city gate and once a day he could return to Karva. That's enough to confirm Ramsey's return. Hearing this, the nun said that is expected from the one who is to kill the demon king. Magnus is really a great magician. The guy squinted and asked that it was sarcasm just now. The old lady grinned and said that it was not so, she was really delighted. Then the guy thoughtfully said that he was also worried that the Doomsday Brigade was looking for Ramsey. Hearing this, the old woman frowned but remained silent. She remembered that man who could use such high-level skills. The guy was worried that the guy knew his level and skills. This Prince Heidel is also from the royal family, so he is also able to identify a person. By constantly training one skill and refusing to raise the status with an increase in the level, you can strengthen the skill itself and even open a group of new ones. Magnus learned about this system from a book. Does Heidel have such knowledge? The guy remembered the prince and sighed. At this time, there was a crash of a glass on the table and the old lady, rubbing her mouth, said that she would personally take Magnus to those places. The surprise guy asked that she would go with him, to which she nodded and said that she also came to Ramsey. The guy nodded and said that it was true. Grinning, the nun told the guy not to worry, she promises that she will not pull them back. The guy nodded and said that then they should hurry up. But the nun, without listening to him, said that in this case they should finish everything faster, because before leaving they should clean everything here. Hearing her words, the guy looked at the table, which was full of dishes and doubtfully asked what they would really eat all this. Some time later, the old lady was shouting merrily while flying on a magic carpet with Magnus. She said it was just something, the wind was so cool. The guy smiled and said, it's all thanks to Narses. Hearing this name, the old woman squinted and asked about what kind of idiot came up with this name and the guy grinned and thought that everyone was saying that. With a close look in his eyes, the guy looked ahead and said to the old lady to look there. There are ancient ruins there. These are the remains of a 500-year-old former city of the strongest magical empire. Looking at the pyramid, the old lady said that they lived in such giant iron boxes. What were they thinking about? The guy smiled and said that this is the perfect fortress from external enemies, isn't it? The old lady folded her arms under her chest and said that Magnus was a prosaic person. He is not a magician for nothing. The guy smiled and said that probably thanks to the magic items, it was quite comfortable to live there. With dead eyes, the old lady said that she would still not want to live forever in a meaningless iron box, without a sky, sun and moon above her head. It's probably very stressful. Although the guy was touched by the old woman's words, he quickly regained his former mood and said that thanks to this box, the ancient ruins were perfectly preserved. If it had been a typical city building, it would have been buried in the sand, and he would never have appeared on earth again. The old lady said that adventurers are looking for unexplored ruins dreaming of writing their name in history, 
but such a pleasure is worth a lot of money. Not without rich merchants, with aristocrats trying to figure out the secrets of the ruins. It seems that all conditions have been created for them in the current national policy of the kingdom. The old lady remembered her friend and said that he, too, had always been attracted to the ancient ruins. And finally they reached the ruins, the guy looked at this splendor with admiration. There were guards standing next to the constellation entrance, as expected, and they did not let anyone inside. These ruins were the ruins of the tabla. Looking ahead, the old lady said that it was quite noisy there. There was someone shouting that he had a second class pass and that the guards should look carefully. What does it mean that they cannot pass? In front of the guards were three twins with the admission of the second rank. The first twin with three bangs showing the scroll shouted that it was a second class pass unless the guard sees it. The second twin with one bang on the left said that as the security thinks how much money they spent to buy it. The third twin with bangs on the other side said, added that therefore they should let them in. The guard put his hand on the shoulder of the first twin and said that of course he was sorry, but they needed a first class pass to explore the ruins of Tabla. Then, making a face, the guard told him to get lost. Constellation with tears in his eyes, the first twin said that they had no more money. In addition, a first class pass is not something that an ordinary adventurer can handle. The second twin was furious and cursed these guys, and at that time Magnus cut in between them and said that then he could pass with this pass. After reading the pass that Magnus showed, the guards turned pale and asked in a daze that it was a first class pass. It was even written by the crown prince and the princess in their own handwriting. Of course they could not prevent them and Milanka stepped aside. When Magnus started to climb with the constellation of the nun, he saw that these three did not come in and asked them what they had covered up, did they not want to go inside? The three brothers looked at each other and eventually ran after Magnus. The twins soon introduced themselves. The one with the three bangs was Ted, with the bangs to the right was Rudd and with the bangs to the left was Motto. Ted smiled and said they were triplets and gatherers. If we talk about gatherers, then this is a unique profession for Aravana. They dig up and explore ancient ruins and differ from thieves only in that they have a license. Continuing on, Ted explained that so far they had been exploring the ruins with a fourth grade pass. Rudd continued for him, who said that they thought it was time to get rich and therefore decided to buy a second class. The guy turned around with interest and asked about what motivates them so much, to which Motto clenched his fist and said that they were ready to do anything for this. Seeing such a brother, Rudd dreamily raised his head and said that the whole point is that there are three girls in their hometown town who are also triplets and they want to come back with a lot of money and make a smart offer to them. All three of them looked at the guy with an embarrassed smile and he also smiled and said that he was Magnus and the old lady introduced herself as Clem. Magnus told Anem that they are looking for a man named Ramsey and they assume that he is in these ruins. Hearing the name of the great adventurer, Ted shuddered and asked what Magnus Dono was talking about, namely the legendary Ramsey Dono. Smiling, his brother Rudd said that when it comes to finding people, they are the best in this business. Motto continued his brother's words, saying that they wanted to thank Magnus and Klim for their help and therefore they would help and see each other soon. Looking down at them, Klim said that this little one should not get under her feet, and hearing this, the guy could not think that she was too rude. But the triplets did not seem to be upset by this. Ted clenched his fist and said that of course they would be able to stand up for themselves. Rudd proudly smiled and said that in the end they were all experienced adventurers and at the end Motto added that they would never bother them. The old lady waved them away and seeing this, the guy shuddered. The triplets were very confident. But anyway, Magnus didn't think they had reached at least level 10, so they should be on their guard. They finally reached the light at the end of the tunnel. And when the vision opened, Magnus looked admiringly at the gorgeous city. The city was filled with wonders. Take the same trees that flew on some crystals, or figures flying on balloons, it all looked magical and mysterious. Not only Magnus was delighted, but the triplets, and even Klim, too. The guy said that even though it's an underground city in ruins, but it's so bright here, even though there seems to be no sky above them. Rudd grinned and pointed to the ceiling and said that it was a magical object, if he didn't see that the ceiling was shining. Shocked, Magnus looked at the shining ceiling and asked if the whole ceiling was really one big magical object. Shifting his gaze to another magical object, the guy asked that the thing with the beast that releases water generates it itself, and the one with the tree purifies the air. It all seemed so cool to the guy that his eyes even glistened and his cheeks were filled with blush. Feeling the gaze, the guy awkwardly wiped the saliva from his mouth and said that they should go ahead in search of Ramsey, Dono. The triplets also followed them, shouting for them to wait for them too. 
After a while, in the same ruins on the fourth level, in a hidden room, dozens or maybe hundreds of flying monsters flew out from behind the trap, and the triplets were in a strong fright. Looking at them with displeasure, Klim clasped her hands in prayer and asked them why they were making a noise. Didn't they say they had already explored the hidden rooms? Shocked, Rudd said that it was on level 6, it was safe there, is it really so dangerous here? Magnus looked at them with an unreadable expression and said that, how should he say it more delicately? Usually there are traps in hidden rooms and quite deadly ones. Rudd still didn't believe it, because there were so many of these birds. Magnus and Klim simultaneously noticed the peculiarity of these birds and used stones. The guy read a spell and stone bullets flew up, crashing into everyone at once. The birds began to fall to the ground completely shattered. And while the guy was shooting stone bullets, Magnus ordered Gladius to stand at the entrance and covered the nun with himself. Klim grinned and said that she would hold him with magic and use the divine blessing. Thanks to the buff, Gladius has risen to a new level of strength and his attack and defense have increased. The golem stood at the entrance, blocking the passage and every bird that flew in his direction got at the seams. That's how, thanks to shrapnel from stones and Gladius, they destroyed hundreds of birds, and the triplets, seeing this madness, were shaking with fear. When it was finally over, Rudd said he thought he was going to die of fright. Motto nodded to his brother, also trembling, said that it was also the first time he had seen such monsters. Magnus, shaking off the fervor from his hands, asked if they were all right, to which Ted said that they had been warned about traps, but these treasures were really difficult to get without someone else's help. Smiling, the guy took out a map and said that there seemed to be two more hidden rooms, didn't they want to check? Startled, Rudd recoiled and said in a panic that he had had enough. Let them cross over and look for Ramsey, don't know. Closing the scroll back, Magnus said that as long as he and Klim are with them, he doesn't think anything will happen to them at all, then why won't they take it? Hearing this, Motto said that they could not hide behind their backs forever and then divide the treasures. Only the two of them deserve all the earned treasures, and they should refuse. Magnus nodded, and said that then he understood. Then, approaching the treasures, he said that then they should divide everything into five. But first, they should search for their goal. Klim folded her arms under her chest and nodded too. Ted Constellation with tears in his eyes, looked at these two, and Rudd said they were such good guys. It can't even be true, Motto said they were worried they would suffer losses. Waving her hand, Klim grinned and said that everything was fine, because sharing benefits with others was also a pleasant way of life. And here they are in the next room and now they have been attacked by strange black golems in the form of a black panther with three eyes. But it was alright, because Magnus was here. Although Klim helped a lot, the triplets, though useless, tried very hard to keep up and eventually managed to take care of themselves. After the fight, the wounds of all were healed by Klim and these three adventurers cheerfully thanked the old lady. Time passed and now they had already reached the eighth level of the ruins of Tabla. Going down the spiral staircase, Magnus said that Ramsey's destination should be somewhere here. Also, from this moment on, the map is useless because these places have not been explored. Ted, following Magnus and Klim, asked what it meant Ramsey, Dono should be here somewhere. Magnus nodded and said they should keep their eyes open. Klim scratched her chin thoughtfully and said that Ramsey has the ability to hide his tracks, which is of course good, but not very good in their case. Excited, Motto asked about the fact that he was a legendary adventurer, wasn't he? The three brothers raised their fists excitedly and shouted that they should not miss a single rustle. In addition, they also have to beware of monsters here. As soon as they said this, one of the types of monsters here appeared in the attic, but Magnus easily incinerated him. Klim, dissatisfied, putting her hands on her sides, said that now other guards will flock to this one. He did not do very well, because it is not difficult to notice him. Grinning, the guy said that this is why only the guards will not come here, but also someone else. While he was talking, monsters were already starting to appear on the roofs. Shocked, Klim said that Magnus really did it on purpose. The new monsters were also consumed by the flames and seeing this, the brothers could not help but admire. Rudd said that as expected from Magnus, Dono and Klim, San, they are incredible. Motto nodded and said that there was no danger for them. While they were talking, there was a clatter of feet and everyone turned around. Magnus immediately pushed the triplets away and shouted for them to be careful. Two centaur-like creatures, or golems, were rushing straight at them. The blow fell on Magnus, and he was electrocuted. Seeing this, the triplets screamed that Magnus, Dono had saved them, and Klim sighed all crumpled up. Soon, the centaur with three bodies stopped and turned towards Magnus. The guy sighed thanks to the ring of the guardian angel, which increased his resistance to magic. 
he immediately summoned Gladius, who grabbed the giant by the legs. Gritting his teeth, the guy thought that the damage was more than he expected. Gladius stands tall, but before this giant, he looks like a little soldier. At that moment, someone's voice was heard shouting to them to come into the house faster. Clem and the triplets followed the advice and Magnus hurried last. The giant stopped and began to look around. Magnus was standing next to the door, the triplets hid behind the table, and Clem just stood aside. After looking around and not finding the intruders, the golem retreated, not even paying attention to Gladius, who was on the street. The guy, not understanding what the matter was, thought about the fact that this big guy went back, but with such a body, he could easily destroy everything here. The frightened triplets, not believing in their salvation, said that they, after all, were saved. The other two brothers hugged each other, sobbing happily. A male voice rang out from the constellation side of the stairs, telling them that it was close. Everyone turned in that direction and saw an old black man with gray hair, a mustache, and a goatee. It was the legendary former adventurer Ramsey. Scratching his beard, the old man asked that they had all come here in search of him. Grinning, Klim slapped the old man on the back and said that of course it was. I can't believe this old man got all the way here. Rudd said they were so lucky. And Motto, all pale and covered in sweat, said he thought he was going to die here. Ted also asked about why the golem stopped chasing them. The old man smiled and said that there are two types of keepers, with permission to damage buildings and without. Rudd quickly realized that they were attacked by the one who was without permission. The guy thought about it and remembered that it was in his book of the world. The guy was still not satisfied and asked about it, since the old man found out about what type of golem that was. The old man said that there was no way, he did not check every single one. Then the guy became even more interesting and the old man said that it was just his intuition. If you stay in the ruins long enough, you will not be able to determine the keeper by the first glance. While Magnus was looking at this veteran in shock, the old man smiled and asked them if they would like to join him for lunch. There was a fire-type magic item in front of them. More precisely, he let the fire out of himself and if you were careful, you could easily cook food on it. Magnus asked with interest how the old man would know the time if there was no sun, to which he grinned and said that it would somehow happen by itself. Then Magnus moved on to the magic item and asked what about it. What is it all about? This belongs to Ramsey, don't know. The old man shook his head and said that all this was already in the house. He was able to guess how to use them. The triplets were admired by the old man, but he only laughed at their praise. Magnus was thinking that this old man really is a living example of ancient ruins. Looking at the old man who tasted the food, the guy said that he was exactly what he was looking for. When they had already sat down at the dinner table, Magnus said that he had gone on a journey to kill the demon king. Then he said that as part of this he was going to explore the ancient ruins. Then the guy asked Ramsey what he thought about lending Magnus his experience and skills. The old man thought about it, and while he was thinking, the guy was thinking about his own. The old man had already retired once, and therefore he did not know how to persuade this old man. Then Klim asked if Ramsey had managed to achieve his goal, to which he shook his head and said that not yet but he did not want to stay in this stinking place forever. Smiling, the old lady asked the triplets if they knew what they called this old man before. Ted smiled and said that his name was the Legend of Returns. Rudd smiled and said that he returned alive even from the most difficult and dangerous ruins. That's why they called him that. Motto also supported the brothers and said that the old man's friends were also returning. There were so many legends and stories. Sighing, the old man said that only not all the legends of this world are true. The surprised guy asked what Ramsey, Dono meant. Klim answered this by saying that in truth, the chance to survive with Ramsey was incredible, but not absolute. As far as she knew, their hero had lost seven friends in 40 years of adventures. Hearing this, Magnus looked at the old man, who was sitting in silence with his eyes closed. Klim eating porridge said that in this place Ramsey also lost his comrade. This was the seventh and final victim. After that, he retired. The old man clenched his fists and said that Kine was still so young. He had his whole life ahead of him. Eight years ago, in the desert, Kine a young boy with shining eyes asked about how he looked when he defeated the monsters. Ramsey smiled and said that it looked like the training was not in vain, and one of the soldiers said that he was nothing like that. Kine grinned and said that of course it was, he would be Ramsey's successor. The soldier smiled and said that this incredible guy still can't really drink, but already almost like them. Another soldier nodded and said that a great future awaits him. Ramsey had never met someone so talented again. They continued training and one day, Kane could become a living legend. When they reached the 8th level, they were chased by that giant and the adventurers, running away from him, hid in one hut when Ramsey shouted at them. 
When they reached the hut, they all breathed a sigh of relief because the golem was gone. Then the soldiers began to ask if everything was here. Someone said that after all, this level is still too much for them, so they should return. And suddenly someone noticed that Kain was not there. Ramsey came out as soon as he heard this and there he saw Kaney's lifeless body in the crater. It looks like she was crushed. Ramsey immediately went with the co-star to her family and apologized to them. He was ready to take anything in his direction. But her parents did not scream and only cried a little. Her mother sadly let out tears and said that Kaino wanted to one day become the same legendary adventurer as Ramsey. Dono. She was glad that she could travel with them. That's what Kaina's parents said. This was far worse than any accusations the old man had ever heard. Bowing his head, Ramsey said that they didn't even take a single thing of hers with them. They were so scared that they ran away without looking back. The old man was very sorry, so much so that it is impossible to convey in words. Therefore, unable to stand it, he retired from business. Then Magnus said that but he's still here. Ramsey nodded and said he wanted to see if someone could defeat that silver golem. That's why he comes to visit him every year, so he can collect Kaina's things and honor her memory. The guy nodded and said that so that's what the whole problem of the tablet is. This golem is a truly terrifying monster, and he understands the situation with Ramsey, so he still decided to defeat this golem. At his words, everyone started and looked at him. Rudd asked in a panic that Magnus really wasn't joking. Motto supported his brother, saying that this was a monster that the legendary adventurer couldn't even cope with. Grinning, the guy said that he had found out the information they needed in advance. The name of this golem is Centurion and he is the boss of the 8th floor. A golem with an exorbitant level of magic resistance. He is the sworn enemy of any magician and he was created by a once developed magical civilization. Shocked, Ted asked if it was even possible to find out such detailed information. But the guy didn't stop there, proudly expanding the pile. He knocked himself into the pile and said that despite all that was said, he was still going to beat him. Soon Magnus, Clem and Gladius went outside and as soon as the guy felt the trembling of the earth, he immediately informed Clem about it. She grinned and said that it was not necessary to warn her because she would know when she heard footsteps. The guy nodded and said that then he didn't have to worry about it anymore. Laughing, the old lady told him to drop these words of his and it would be better to tell something else. Putting her hands on her sides, Klim told him to also stop adding the prefix Dono to her name, to which he nodded and raised his staff. As soon as the golem appeared in sight, the guy immediately called Gladius and he grabbed the opponent by the legs. Of course, the centaur did not stand still and began to beat Gladius on the back with his weapons. The guy smiled and said that as he had planned, the golem could not turn around in this narrow space. He can't use his power to destroy buildings, which means he's been captured. Immediately, both Magnus and Klim began using Bufi on Gladius and he received an increase in strength dexterity, resistance, and protection. Some time ago, the guy discussed Klim's plan. He explained to her that Gladius is the same as Centurion. Because it is made of precious metal, it has a high magic resistance. However, its additional amplifications will not be superfluous. The protective magic used by monks is more effective than that of magicians. As long as these effects are from different classes, they can complement each other. That's why they need Klim's help. Grinning, Klim said that he could leave it to her. Gladius endured the giant's blows thanks to buffs and also used his punches according to the guy's instructions. One of his hands was engulfed in flames and the other was filled with cold and they both crashed into the opponent. The golem, seeing these two, used his magic and she hit the guy and Klim paralyzed them. But before that, the guy himself used paralysis on himself and Klim. Thanks to this, they avoided the effects of the enemies he magic. The golem started filling his staff with lightning again and seeing this Magnus clenched his teeth. But at that moment something hit the shelf and threw him aside. Looking towards the house, the golem saw an old man with a crossbow. The legendary adventurer grinned and said that no wholesaler could do better than him. Inside the house, a surprised Rudd said that the old man really got in. Ted nodded and said that he was really amazing, because he hit with such a small arrow. Mata was also happy, saying that with this their chance to win was increased. If the golem's weapon is deflected in this way during the attack, it simply will not be able to hit Magnus and Klim. Grinning, Motto said that this monster doesn't even have a chance to counterattack. Smiling, the old man said that everything was working out as Magnus had planned. The guy turned around and said to Klim that it was time to act. She grinned and said that the magic of some monks does not work until they touch the target, and therefore she slapped the guy on the back shouting that he should hold. The guy got the treatment and was completely on target again. 
The woman said that the couple would join the battle in Magnus and he nodded and began to form a new spell. Since he was able to cope with Durbanvat, there is not a single reason for losing to the Centurion. Magic sounded and shrapnel stones flew into the golem. At the same time, Gladius pushed the Centurion away, and he hit right on the magic. That's how the invincible boss of these ruins was defeated. Excited Motto said that they really won and his brother supported him and said that Magnus was really an incredible magician. Flim took out the ancient Aravan refined silver and said that there was enough for everyone. The guy smiled and said that it was all thanks to everyone, not just him alone. Turning, Magnus saw that the old man was standing over the corpse of the golem and thinking about something. The guy smiled and said that they could already go, to which he nodded. Some time later, they reached the very place where Kain was crushed. She was still lying there, transformed into a skeleton. Bowing down in front of her, the old man said that he was very sorry in front of her. Eight years had passed, and now he had come. After that, the old man began to collect the bones of the former student constellation with tears in his eyes and Magnus followed all this. Soon they came out right in the city through the guy's portal, which shocked Klim and the three brothers. The next day in the city of Karba, the old man approached Magnus and happily said that he was grateful to all of them. Then Magnus asked that everything should be over now, to which he said that he would never have thought that he would ever do it. He took the remains to Kana's parents and she was finally buried. Bowing, the old man thanked the guy and said that he was going to take care of all of them and did not want to say goodbye now. The delighted guy asked that then he would be with them, to which the old man nodded and knocked himself into the pile, and then said that he would accompany them wherever they went, and they would definitely return alive from there. They can trust him with ancient ruins. The delighted guy stretched out his hand and thanked Ramsey Dono. The old man smiled and said that it was possible without Dono. Isn't that how he already addresses this old lady? From now on, they will be friends, because they should get along well, nodded and said that then he would try. At this time, Klim appeared behind the triplets and, slapping them on the backs, asked about what kind of young people would also join their adventures. All three started, but then raised their heads. The old lady said that she vouches for his identity, but whether these chickens return home safely depends only on the legend of the returns. Everyone looked at the old man who turned pale from such pressure, but Klim did not stop there. Poking the old man with her finger, she said that they would definitely come back, so the old man seemed to say, of course she didn't want to find fault. But surely a magician of such caliber as Magnus wouldn't be able to survive alone. Klim pressed the old man even more and said that in order to raise first-class adventurers from these chickens, he must be who he is. That is, he must be a legendary adventurer, damn him. The old man remembered Kyle and clenched his fist and turned pale. Klim turned to Ted Rudd and Motto and said, Mime, that they could refuse after all. There was nowhere without risk in this case. Ted, on behalf of all three of them, moved forward and said that of course they understand that they lack abilities, but they are ready to do whatever is required of them. So they asked to be allowed to join. Rudd excitedly clenched his fist and said that they just fell in love with them and therefore would follow them even to hell. Excited Motto said that probably the old man himself would be pleased to teach anyone again. The old man remembered Kylie's face and thought about whether it was worth trying again. It was a very difficult choice for him. The old man looked at these three youngsters and then remembered Kaina and decided anyway. Smiling, he said that this Ramsey, nicknamed the Legend of the Return, would certainly return all six members of their team alive. Hearing him, everyone smiled contentedly and shouted joyfully. Smiling, Rudd said that Ramsey's legend is not over yet because now they will create a new legend about how they will all become legendary adventurers. The search for the items of this group necessary to conquer the eight demonic generals and the demon king himself has begun. Thanks to the strategy book, they searched the targeted ruins one by one. They took out a rare item, the soul of an ifrit, as well as absolute air. They also took out a book on magical strengthening. A book on magical strengthening, Shadow 4, Acid 4, as well as Beatification 2. Later, they also took out Wind 4 and Mana Strike 4. In addition, they also had a great time. Everything was strikingly different from the days when he was in Eugene's party. If it wasn't for the Book of the World, then he wouldn't have been able to achieve all this in such a short period of time. A few days later, the guy returned to the general base and Rudd asked him if he had a good night last night. The guy looked away in embarrassment and thought that of course he liked it. Upon returning to Lacoste after a long time, he did not expect Arya to buy a new house. Arya then said that thanks to Magnus, the supply of rare items, sales figures just skyrocketed and that's why Arya bought a new house. Scratching his head in embarrassment, the guy thought that who would have thought that he would have a new house before the wedding. 
sighing. The guy thought that even though Arya is a very beautiful girl, she has no less stubbornness or rather courage. At this time, some people in canopies appeared and asked the magician that he was Magnus Dono. Then they said that their lord had invited him to a meeting. While everyone was looking shocked, the guy nodded indifferently. After a while, the guy was greeted by the princess. The princess, sitting on her back against the guy, asked for forgiveness for such a sudden call and said that she usually came herself on such occasions, but now she decided not to stand out. They were sitting in a beautiful dream and a gorgeous table was set in front of them. The guy smiled and said that it was nothing and there was nothing wrong with that. The princess smiled and said that she appreciated it. The guy looked suspiciously at the princess and thought that he did not expect this. Then he asked if it was safe enough here, to which the girl waved her hand and said that this was a store that at least didn't make a fuss if she came. Now all the guests are below his guard, so he can relax and feel at ease. The triplets looked down and saw the burly men saying in surprise that they were all guards, as expected from the princess. Unlike these three, Klim looked only at the food. Smiling, she said that just look at this lamb on a spit. The meat looks so delicious and shiny that she can't resist. Seeing this behavior of a friend, the old man told her not to forget about her age. Looking at the old man with displeasure, the woman told him not to spoil her appetite. Sighing. The old man turned his head in the direction of Princess Farah and asked that they had not come here for free food. The girl laughed merrily and said that everything was fine. There is no point in cooking food if no one is going to eat it, so they cannot be shy and eat what they want. The guy was still full of suspicion. Looking at her, Magnus asked Farah that she had secretly left the capital for him, so what did she want him to do? The princess seriously asked if the guy knew a city called Neris. Ted replied saying that it was a big city about three kilometers south of here. The girl nodded and said that the garrison sent from the capital is now based there. The guy nodded and said that he had heard gossip, but in fact it was not true. He just found out about it in the Book of the World. Two said she was being followed, so she couldn't say it directly. In the area of Karkala, which is south of Neris, an anomaly occurs. This interested the guy and then the princess said that towns and villages just disappear there without a trace. Then the guy asked about the people, to which the princess said that everything was fine with them, but they also moved along with the cities. Traders with adventurers were the first to notice this anomaly, and of course they immediately reported it to the government. At first they thought that they had just made a mistake in the map and got lost in the desert, but later other people began to report this who stumbled upon towns and villages not marked on the maps. Thinking about it, the guy said that this was really a problem. He exclaimed to himself that this was a huge problem for him. If nothing is done, it will simply be impossible to continue searching in the ruins. One of the magical items that he should get, just the same, is located in the area of the ruins of Kakral. In that case, while the guy was thinking, the princess made the first move by moving closer. She said that she was offering a deal. The guy smiled and said that he also wanted to offer it. The princess smiled and said that they seemed to be on the same wavelength, to which the guy said that her majesty always speaks so quickly, it's in his favor. The girl clenched her fist, with a cold sweat, said that this was a problem. She was not sure that it could be solved with the help of the army. Therefore, she would like to ask the guy as a representative of the kingdom of Lacusta for cooperation. Of course, it will not be free. The guy smiled at such words. The girl clenched her fist and said that she would use his success in solving the case to get a special class permit for him from the king himself. The guy nodded with a smile and said that it was better that way, because he agreed. The girl was happy about this, so they sealed it with a handshake. The guy smiled to himself and thought that, as planned, this bonus event appeared the other day in the Book of the World. The event named Fulfill the Request of Princess Farah and Save the Disappearing Towns and Villages has started. Suddenly the guy was pulled to her and the princess pressed him to her chest while happily thanking him. From this, the guy blushed all over and was covered with cold sweat running down his face. He immediately shouted at her not to do it, and after that, the watching triplets also all blushed. The princess also said that she was just beside herself with happiness. He should be patient for a while. The guy with the clouded mind thought that as expected it was unexpected. He should hold on. All sweating and blushing, the guy still couldn't stand it and got out and said that it was too much. The girl laughed merrily and asked for forgiveness while the guy wiped the sweat from the constellation of his forehead. At that moment Ted came up to him asking him what it was, to which the guy irritably said not to ask. At the same time, suddenly two curved arcs appeared on the door, and then he fell, raising his fervor. A man came in and immediately the guards got ready for battle. A man with long hair, a light beard and a sword in a scabbard went inside and called Princess Farah. Then he said that the princess's family was convicted of fraud, which means she is sentenced to death. 
He was one of the six stars from the National Defense Corps. He was a scabbard expert named Brown. On the other side, the second door was also cut open and a dark-skinned girl with a gorgeous bust came in. Bending slightly, the girl with the sabers in her hands told Ramsey that he had better give them his strength, otherwise they would take it by force. It was the other of the six stars from the National Defense Corps. Her nickname was the Dancer of the Constellation of Death, Tayton. The guards, of course, immediately stood up and shouted that they should protect Her Majesty. But less than a second later, the shelter and guts of the hacked guards flew everywhere. They were two stars, they are not so easy to beat. Grinning, the old man said that these brats couldn't even warm him up. The girl grinned and said that it was too fast. On the second floor, the triplets turned pale and were covered with cold sweat running down their faces. However, old Klim was no exception. Looking at Tayton, the old man asked her about what she had forgotten here, to which she replied with a question about what he himself had forgotten here. Smiling, Tayton still decided to give in and said that there were rumors that Ramsey was hiding in this store and of course she immediately rushed over. Snorting, the old man also said that it was really a coincidence, because he finally had the opportunity to eliminate the princess, so he came here. Grinning, both raised their heads and asked each other that maybe then they would finally get down to business, because they should return to the chapter with good news. The pale princess and Ramsey looked down at these two bloody people. Recoiling, Farah asked about who they were, they were so strong, to which Magnus said that they were a six-star special squad. It is a unit of the National Defense Corps. Taking out their swords, the triplets shouted that they would clear their fetters and leave the princess on them. Magnus called them and Klim irritably told them not to get carried away. Smiling, the triplets said that they had been through a lot, so they are not the same as before. With these words, they ran down. Seeing this, the guy shouted for them to stop, because their levels are low. Turning around, the guy looked at the headlight and, clenching his teeth in irritation, thought that he could not leave the princess alone. Ted shouted that they would try their best. Rudd supported him, saying that really this little brother did not want to play with them, to which Motto said that cheating was not good. Looking at them, an old man with a rotten expression on his face said that he did not have time for these fools, and then the dark-skinned girl grinned and said that he should not worry, because she would take care of them. They'll get what they want. A couple of strokes of the blade in a beautiful dance and now all the triplets' clothes are cut into pieces. All three were dumbfounded, and when they came to their senses, they screamed in embarrassment as if they had been bitten. The girl laughed and said that it suits them, but these boys are not at all to her taste. Looking at them, the guy was relieved that she decided not to kill them, but just to make fun of them. Maybe there really is a benefit from their low level. While they were watching, another star went up to the second floor and seeing these two asked if they really thought he would let them just sit here and watch what was happening below. The guy and the old lady exchanged glances and Klim said that things looked bad. Magnus nodded and said that if he gave his all and attacked, then there would be nothing left of this store. Seeing their calmness, the old man asked them that they still have time to discuss, but it's still useless. Magnus stood in front of the princess and then the old man asked that he seriously likes being cannon fodder. The guy looking at him thought that there was nothing surprising here. Everyone reacts like that when they see a magician in the vanguard. Grinning, the man took out his sword and taking a pose said that it looks like this guy is another idiot, so he should not wait for mercy. He swung his sword with a jerk, but the guy pushed back avoiding the blow. It was not only thanks to his stats, but also a new mantle. The wind mantle increased agility. The shocked man said that this was some kind of nonsense. This guy had just managed to evade his scabbard. Grinning, the guy thought that probably this old man did not even imagine in his dreams that when and where to see a level 36 magician. This is as rare as meeting a monster in the very center of the city. The guy calmly looked at this guy and asked that he should be somewhere at level 20, isn't it? He shuddered and said that he was 19. Then the guy turned some kind of disc on his raincoat and grinned and said that he was not even a match for Eugene. Immediately after, it began to vibrate strangely. And seeing this, the old man turned pale. Because right now he was surrounded by several magicians who deviated from his scabbard. It was a special effect of the wind mantle, the creation of doppelgangers. With the drawing of the sword, the old man cut one of the clone's head, from which he dissipated, and then proceeded to the other. Looking at these attempts, the guy grinned and said that this old man called him an idiot, and added that there would be no mercy, and he didn't even need magic to defeat such a nobody. The difference in levels and status alone will bring him an easy victory. With a quick jerk, the guy found himself next to the star and his staff knocked out the last one right on the forehead. Having beaten him properly, the guy breathed a sigh of relief. Looking at the poor old man, Klim and the princess were slightly stunned. 
there was no living place left of the old man's face. At this time, the deaf dancer was dancing with the youngsters, mocking them and shouting asking them where they were going, but how much confidence they had in the beginning. Of course, they don't have the knack. Suddenly the girl felt that the aura of her friend disappeared and stopped, and then she felt a knife in her throat, and was covered with cold sweat. Old man Ramsey told her not to move, or she'd be finished. Grinning, Ramsey said that she really was an amateur, she didn't even look around properly. That's who really lacks the knack, so it's her. The girl let go of the sabers from her hand looking at the old man and they fell with a crash. The delighted triplets looked at the teacher and smiled happily. The princess ordered the remaining more or less intact soldiers to take the violators to the dungeon. Before, of course, they were tied up. After the orders, the princess apologized to Magnus for dragging him into this mess. She said she didn't have enough words to properly thank the guy for his help. Smiling, the guy told her not to worry about it. After all, they put his ally's life at risk, so everything is mutual. Thinking about it, the princess said that although she understands why they need her, but why do they need Sir Ramsay? The guy put his hands on his sides and said that he thinks they came with the same purpose for which he was looking for him. There are a hundred reasons why someone needed a legendary adventurer. At this time, Klim, who was treating everyone, heard their conversation and intervened, saying that it seemed the National Defense Corps was planning to explore the ancient ruins. The guy nodded and said that he also thinks. Then the princess said with a twinkle in her eyes that she thought Magnus was incredibly strong. It feels like his power has no limits. Folding his arms under his chest, the guy looked doubtfully at the princess and said that there was no need to thank him. He had said that a minute ago. The girl smiled and said that well, she would still like to express her gratitude not only with words, but also with something useful. And with these words she gave him the key. Uncomprehendingly bowing his head, the guy asked about what kind of key it was and then the girl smiled and said that it was the key to her room in the Imperial Palace. The surprised guy immediately gave it back and with a cold sweat running down his face said he didn't need it. Grinning, the princess said that it was about the fact that he could just calmly enter her chambers. She didn't mean anything like that. The guy recoiled blushed and seeing this, the prince laughed, said that the steam did not build such a face. She would let him into her bed. He talked her into it. Indignantly, the guy walked away and said that he was not building anything and did not need this thing. The girl laughed merrily and said that she was just joking. Magnus seems not only strong, but also very cute. He's such a darling. Then she took the hand of the blushing guy and said that if he still needed a personal meeting or some kind of service one day, it was a sign that she would always be glad to see him, so he should take it. Looking at the key, the guy thought that these girls would definitely bring him to the grave. A couple of days later, a carpet plane was flying through the hot desert among an army right in the middle. It was the region of Albana Cackrell, and the carpet plane was accompanied by cavalry from the Accident Investigation Department. The guy sitting on the carpet thought that at the moment the issue of the disappearance of villages and towns in the Cackrell region is being studied. They accompany the legion that deals with this case. Magnus himself, his team, and Princess Pharaoh were sitting on the carpet. Looking ahead, the delighted girl said that even though the Imperial family has four of these, it is the first time she sees a magic carpet of this size. Ramsey anxiously asked the princess that she was sure it was worth behaving so loudly, because they were not on an excursion. Smiling, the princess awkwardly scratched her head and apologized, saying that she simply could not leave the palace every day, now she would be more careful. Grinning, Klim told her not to listen to this old alarmist. It doesn't matter if she's upset or nervous, it won't affect the incident in any way. Therefore, they should relax and enjoy the ride. With these words, the old lady laughed loudly and seeing her enthusiasm, the princess also supported her by laughing loudly. After she calmed down a bit, she said that she liked the way this old lady looked at life. She thought that the nuns were all stuffy and stubborn. It seems it's time for her to reconsider her views on this matter. Grinning, the nun said that she, too, thought that the princesses were just silly, not capable of anything, but she liked Princess Farah. Looking at these two, old man Ramsey said with concern that they were too careless. Magnus smiled and said there was nothing to worry about. While they are on the road, they can relax a little. While the young and old lady were chatting merrily, the guy noticed something and turned around and said that at least until they find out who is behind this incident. The sun was shining over the desert sky and the cavalrymen were still walking steadily towards their intended goal. Then someone asked Mr. Magnus about how he thinks the settlements have disappeared. The guy thoughtfully said that he believes that the giant sandworm is to blame for everything. 
Ted was surprised to say that he had heard of them. Huge creatures that devour everything indiscriminately, they are insistent monsters. Then Rudd said that usually they can't swallow anything bigger than a horse. Then Magnus explained to his group that the giant worm lives for hundreds of years, and then goes into hibernation. After hibernation, it turns into an emperor worm and its size can reach the size of an entire city. Startled, Princess Farah folded her arms under her chest and said that she thought it would not be difficult to swallow the chariot. Magnus nodded and said that it could be very dangerous further. She'd better retreat with the soldiers. The guy said it was, but then. The guy did not let the princess continue and said that of course he understands that the army needs to show that it is able to settle the matter quickly. This is politics, and therefore he easily understands. The girl looked at him with a puzzled face, and the guy continued, saying that, however, he would not like to sacrifice people. Therefore, the guy smiled and said that this is why her majesty should for her sake. But before he could finish, the girl happily smiled and said that he was so caring. It's good that you can rely on him. Suddenly, at this time, a voice from below was heard telling the princess not to listen to this man. After all, people like him cannot be trusted. A crook like him can't fool him. It was a man in general's clothes. He was the head of the Albanian army, General Takar. The outraged princess shouted at General Taharoa not to talk like that. Because Magnus is not a crook, but a hero who did not save the kingdom. How dare he slander him? The general frowned and said that it was very unfortunate that the princess, being of royal blood, was protecting this buffoon, rubbing his mustache, and looked at Magnus with contempt and asked about what he was talking about some worm emperor, and he cleverly came up with, imagines himself a hero of legends, so he makes up tall tales. Annoyed, Magnus asked this general if he had some kind of action plan, to which the general laughed and said that to go to war on old wives' tales, he should keep his pocket wider. Hearing this, all the soldiers also laughed. Then the general said that in order to defeat the enemy, loyalty and courage are needed, not a plan of action. The kid should remember this. Raising his sword high, he shouted that he had 3,000 spears under his command and the valor of these same people. They will smash any enemy on their head in a moment. Looking at this idiot, the guy said that he certainly did not want to interrupt such a valiant general, but maybe they would still work together. They have only one enemy, the sandworm. Enraged by his words, the general shouted saying that he wanted him to accept help from such a rascal. He's only hiding behind the princess skirts a lot. Hearing his triplets were very indignant, because this under, general didn't even see a guy in battle, what he was carrying at all. Bending down, the princess apologized for him and seeing this, the guy smiled and said that they should not pay attention to this. The incident is not worth it. Looking ahead with a gloomy face, the guy said that the soldiers would most likely die. Seeing his expression, the girl regretfully closed her eyes. At this time, Klim said that if the army obeys the general, and the general serves the princess, then the princess herself can give the order directly. The girl, with regret, drooping, said that she was formally of course higher than the general but in fact she could only command her guards. The surprised woman asked why the army of the best warriors obeys such a blockhead. The girl with a complex expression lowered her head and said that precisely because they are the best, they will listen only to their general. Her orders are not valid here. Then old man Ramsey asked about the fact that it was impossible to convince Takar. The girl shook her head and said that it was unlikely. After all, he had wooed her once. In the past, the king only accepted gifts from matchmakers and did not make a decision. Candidates for grooms cajoled him as best they could, but left with nothing. In general, nothing good came of it. Tahar undoubtedly wants to use this incident to distinguish himself and show himself, but he is also afraid that Magnus will overshadow him. Smiling, the guy said that it means the situation is already clear, now he has only one request left. The guy raised his finger and said that when the battle begins, the princess should give the order for an immediate retreat. They might not listen to her now, but in the heat of battle, their instincts should work. Smiling, the girl said that it was such a touching concern. Magnus's kindness knows no bounds. The guy was embarrassed and said that it wasn't about kindness, they just didn't need extra sacrifices. People's lives are not a joke. Hearing him, Princess Farah and Klim looked at him with a kind smile and seeing these stares, the guy turned his head in embarrassment and said that they should say if there was something to say, and not just look. Three days passed in Min and now, behind the fog of the sands, something moving could be seen in the distance. Rudd noticed it first and reported it. Of course, they didn't believe him, and old Ramsey asked that maybe his student overheated in the sun. Ted looked at his brother and asked if it was a mirage, but it didn't seem like it. Magnus smiled and said that it was as he had expected the worm, Emperor. In front of the army was a huge worm with a thousand teeth. 